Welcome, everyone. It's Wednesday. It's time for Hollywood on the Rock. My name is Chris Gore. Time to crack one. Cracking one. I'm cracking something open to drink. It's just a soda. It's a delicious soda, which I don't drink very often now. I hope you're doing well today on the show. We're talking about The Last of Us, episode two. What do we think? What does Alan Ng think? He'll be joining me shortly. Can't wait to talk to you about it. Also, the horror film Skinamarink. We didn't get a chance to talk about it last week. Uh, can't wait to tell you my thoughts. Also, The Wandering Earth, part two, an epic Chinese science fiction movie that is now playing in limited release in theaters. So much to discuss. Plus, the film threat, the writers of film threat, the underappreciated writers from film threat are going to be on the show in an hour talking about movies that they saw at the Sundance and the Slam Dance Film Festival. It's going to be a lot of fun. Join us today on Hollywood on the Rocks. I can't wait to talk. I can't wait till Alan gets here. Where's Alan? Where the heck is Alan? Alan hey. hey, look at that background. <laughs> How's it going, man? For, first, my, my background. Are you talking about like my background? So no, no, just... the, uh, the, the oh, background. yeah, 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 the it's Blade Runner background, B Blade Runner inspired. It's not Blade Runner, <laughs> that's true, Blade Runner inspired. Um, Blade Runner. So, real quick, people in the chat, and I, this is okay, not the chat. Let me let me clarify. I did the unthinkable, I read comments on our videos, <laughs> okay. I read comments on our videos. I know, I know I should stay away from it. Sometimes you lurk in there and I'll answer a question, you know, if it's politely asked, I always answer. And there's a lot of, frankly, there are more positive comments than negative comments. But there is a consistent negative comment that has been plaguing us on the Film Threat YouTube channel. And it's about our backgrounds. <laughs> it's about, <laughs> someone described my background as like a flea market. Like I'm at a swap meet. And I'm saying, oh, hey, why hey, not? Do you, get, market? <laughs> do you want to get, do you want, hey, do you want this Ultraman Mego eight inch figure? I've got one for you. It's sitting right here. I got, I got, all, I got an old drive in speaker. I've got Detective Comics number 27. It's a reprint, but come on. Um, and then I've got like an R2D2 cooler that I got from the Star Wars fan club um, when it was cool and used to get, uh, it was it was called Star Wars Insider, and they had a lot of like exclusive merch, merch you could only get from the shop, and I loved it. I thought it was great. So mine is a flea market, but people really don't like your background, Alan. <laughs> they just yeah, don't I like know. it. I know, I know. I, I I don't blame people. I mean, the, the reason it's cluttered is to cover up as much pink as possible, and uh, it didn't work. Well, all I can say is this: that will end. It's yeah. over now. It's it's over. It's going to end. Uh, I you need to you need to paint that background. You need to paint it. You need to what colors? Okay, anyone in the chat? What should Alan paint? And he's going to yeah, film yeah. it so you can literally on a live stream watch paint dry. Yeah, I actually uh, posted that on Discord on our on the Film Threat Discord channel, which if you're a member, you can get an invite to. Um, and so far, I think it's either white or blue. <laughs> All right. Well, this has never happened. This is a first on Hollywood on the Rocks. I am going to do, for the very first time, I am going to do Alan's Corner. All right, I guess you could call this Chris's corner. I, Alan, I am <laughs> challenge. Uh, look, this is you can call it Alan challenge. The Alan challenge. You got to paint the pink. You got to paint the yeah. pink. And I said this on our Oscar live stream. If you paint the pink and kind of redo your room, and I've got like some cool LED lighting that I could give mm -hmm. you that you could kind of put up and make it look. I mean, there are some YouTubers that have really cool spaces. I like what Eric Weber does. He just he has a corner of his place. And he puts like all the Oscar screeners. Mine, I will, I promise I will improve mine. I will improve mine. But if you do that, Alan, I will, I will get you a PS5. This is, and why am I doing this on the live stream? 
because I want people, I want people to hold me to this. If you change your background, you paint it and you film it and put it on there. I will get you a PS five with disc. This is that, you know what this is? This is actually my box. This is the PS five box for me. The one you just bought. <laughs> I did not know. I didn't, I didn't, I got it as a well, gift. No, that's one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I got it as a gift. Yes. I got it as a gift, but um, I will get you a PS five. If you just paint that damn background. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I, I want to see suggested my, colors in the chat. Yeah, I mean, my 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 daughter is very excited about this. Uh, is she? What about the PS5 is. or the background being painted? Uh, both actually, but the <laughs> PS5 is is definitely a motivator. I, okay. I, I we did talk. We'll we'll swap. I'll give you my the Xbox that's in this room. Fair trade, fair trade. I'll no, take the trade. Xbox off your hands. This, but okay. And also, can I just tell you a dumb joke that I've done years ago? All right, weird confession. Weird confession. Into the into my wacky brain and how I think. I love to play practical jokes on people. I learned this from my uncle as a kid. I uh, had a sister growing up. My lovely sister Amy has a beautiful family in Michigan. Uh, love my sister. Um, she tolerated me. I was the older brother, and I played jokes on her all the time. And mm -hmm. um, somehow she still talks to her brother. But I love to play practical jokes on people. You know, I joke a lot on the live stream. Here's a suggestion for a joke. I'm just throwing this out there. If Once you get yourself like a high-end game system and you still have the box, don't throw the box away. Hold on to the box. Fill the box with broken glass, you know, like bottles, um, you know, just like fill it with like beer bottles, you know, it's got to be bottles, glass, and maybe even some broken glass so it breaks. And what you do is you find yourself, you know, just take, go to a public place, film yourself walking, carrying it, and then you drop it. And it's the sound of breaking glass, smashing, and just say, dang it, darn. Oh! And just, okay, I have played this joke. Uh, I got a I got a PS3. This is when it was hard to get a PS3. I got a PS3 and I filled it with broken glass and I showed my friend and I dropped it down these stairs on accident and you could hear the glass breaking. The look I didn't film it though. I didn't film it. Oh, this is I don't know. I should have done that. Uh, but I, I love to play practical jokes. So there you go. And look, you can still have a place for your dog. Your dog is going to appreciate. Let's see. Let's go to the chat here before we get to our reviews. We have a lot of reviews to go over. Uh, I'm going to go into the chat here. Warp Speed Engage, says Lord Thoth. Murdoch 86, best show on the internets. Well, thank you for that. We've got over 200 people watching. You know, give us a like and, and we'll get into that sweet algorithm so more people know about the show. David Glenn, who's a member. Hail everyone who just joined in. Shuxi, my body is ready for today's film threat. Eric Stratton, Chris Gore is no bore and fun loving to the core. I was, okay, in elementary school, I was Chris Bohr and Chris, Chris Whore. <laughs> that was, kids are, kids are, kids are kids. They will mock you and then we'll yes. find something to tease you Mine about. Mine was easy. You just put a vowel, and pick a vowel and, and it'll be obscene. What, Alan Ng? What would be, yeah. what would people, what would people tease you? Uh, like, well, like the, the, like A, so nag. And you can just kind of go down. Go down the uh, oh okay the let's go from there yeah let's yeah. not do that it could be <laughs> dangerous Solomon Thornton greeting film greetings film lovers Paulie from Latino Slant I'm here for it Jinx well Jinx you ask and you shall receive I know what you want I know what you want Jinx sixty nine exactly Jinx really wants sixty nine I didn't mean it to go that way I hope you're not offended I was literally just trying to. Try, I'm trying to be funny, and my attempts are sad. Michael Tynan for $25. Thank you for that. Gentlemen, good to see you. Glad to be here. Thank you. That's going directly to Alan's PS5 fund. So there you go. Fernando Estevez for five. Chris, can you say, I got the wares. If you have the coins, take a look, friend. Wait, I need to, I need to do that better. For five, I need to do that better. I got the wares. If you have the coins, take a look, friend. What is that from? Someone's making fun of me. I am, I am, I'm definitely being made fun of here. MK Solid 82 for Buck 99. Chris, collection tour of your house soon. I will do that. I will do that when Alan is 
does his video watching paint dry. <laughs> I'm going to also do that. Alan is going to paint it pink. Says Davida Duckworth. Paint it, Alan, says yeah, Plastic but, Phoenix. If my wife had any say in this, it would stay pink. It is not going to stay pink. It's going to be YouTube friendly. Uh, Rida Ibn Muhammad, Ice Blue gets my vote. I think something blue would be cool. I mean, I've got these sort of black curtains behind me. You know, I'm just trying to keep the light out because behind me is actually a, a, a windows. And then uh, Ribbon Deal, uh, Deal was Xbox S for PS5. Yep, that's the yep. deal. But, you know, I'm getting a used one. Alan's, Alan's going to get a brand new PS5. Yeah. Um, CD Stein 69, I would go with light gray, blue, cream, or eggshell white. Yeah. I mean, so far, eggshell white seems to be winning. Well, the other thing is, Alan, I have this, um, these LCD, like where you can put up the color. Then you just yeah. change the color of your background. It can be whatever you want. Yeah. By the way, it's LED. LED. Is it LED? Did I say LCD? Yeah, liquid crystal display. That's LCD. Yes, that's a television. Yes. All right. You know, I, that would I'm, be this thing here. I'm pre caffeinated soda in the afternoon. Jinx, go with the rainbow color, Alan, for <laughs> your people. What are you talking about? What do you mean? Yeah, unfortunately, if it was my people, it'd be red. <laughs> uh, well, well, we'll see. Wait, yeah. I have a, I have a video that directly. We have now too many videos. I have to actually. I think I have to. Michael, I have to change it. Yeah, I, you got to start pulling some. We're we're running yeah, out of space. Well, we'll see. Yeah. I don't know. What is when did you do that? Oh, that was uh I think pride two years ago. Okay during the, during the lockdown. <laughs> All right. Wow, I've really uh blasted through some of these. Um let's see. Uh okay, just a few more. We're gonna launch right in Pilgrim Media for two. Chris, you look rested. Yes, well, here's the thing. I went to bed early. I went to well, not quite early last night. I watched uh all Quiet on the Western Front on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I thought it was it's a solid war movie. Uh, German film. I don't know why it was nominated for Best Picture. Well, no, actually, technically, I can tell you why. Because Netflix has very good publicists that mm -hmm. push nominations for certain types of films. So but Doesn't Netflix have like three of the movies on the... Uh... Yes, so I, I actually slept in today. I slept in, literally got up in time to do the nerdrotic nooner. Davina Duckworth, I was just reading about Carrie Fisher this morning. Didn't know her mom was an actress too. Ooh. Yeah, she's uh, she Debbie is Reynolds. Debbie Reynolds, exactly. Yeah. Um, Shuxi, don't do eggshell white. So boring. Well, eggshell white is the base, and then you add like colored lights, and then mm -hmm. other background stuff. So. It's go. it's it's versatile. I think that's because you don't want to go black or dark, dark colors back there. Right, right, right. All right, let's get into it, Alan. Let's get into it. And remember, here's your film threat advisory. We have diverse opinions here on film threat. So just get ready for that. Let's let me let me do a reset here. Doing a reset. Doing a reset, Alan. You know what that means? That means a trying to find a picture all right let's go in uh the last of us premiered a couple weeks ago to most it appeared, of it appeared last week no 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 the, the last was the premiere episode which i watched twice yeah which uh, is premiered. last week yeah right right a uh, premiered and surprisingly a lot of people enjoyed it myself included it was i'm not going to say it was across the board praise but there is something that i've noticed um in common with people who don't like the show the people who don't like the show played, not just played, but were obsessed with the video game. Uh, that was not me. I hadn't played the game, but after the first episode, I went and played the video game and I'm about two, three hours in. So I'm not, I'm literally at the beginning of the journey. Okay. Like I've just gotten Ellie and I are now off on our uh, adventure. That's kind of where I'm at in the video game, which is kind of where we're at in episode two of the show. Um, I can see why people love, love this video game. Um, it's realistic. It's more adventure game than shooter. Uh, the shooter aspects of it, I, I think are, are very well done. It, it does that thing that a, a good adventure game will do, which where there's a learning curve, it kind of eases you into like, you've got to learn how to like pull yourself up, how to 
pick up a ladder and like, I get it. I get it. You're, 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 you're teaching me. And these are simple tasks later on. It'll be tasks mixed with uh, zombies, but the zombies in the last of us are different. They're, they're basically fungi infused former humans that are now a shell of what, what they once were being controlled by this fungus that infects their bodies. Um, and so now that I've played the game, I get why people love it. Uh, I, I though am more open-minded to see where the show goes. And episode two was awesome. It starts out where you see, you, you meet a doctor. Where is it? Is it in like the Philippines? Indonesia. It's Indonesia. in Jakarta. Yeah. Yeah. In Indonesia, you meet this doctor. She goes and, and, and examines this body and basically just says, uh, bomb everything. Her conclusion is, uh, just bomb the cities right now because this is going to spread so quick. It's just going to wipe out humanity. Cut to Joel's story in the present day. So we get the backstory because that happens right around when the outbreak happens around 2003. Cut to the present day with Joel. Um, she now is with Ellie and um, I forget the woman's name. Yeah. Is it is it Earl? Is the woman's <laughs> name Earl? That was the mistake I made the first week. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> and Tess, is it Tess? I think so. I'll look okay. it up. But... All right, just to get it correct. Otherwise, the chat is going to mock me. Um, and what I love about this is I am a huge fan of the zombie genre. Okay, I love it. And what I like is each zombie film and or movie will kind of add a, a its own wrinkle, just something different that we haven't seen before. And in this, the rules are, this is why I feel like I'm, I'm lost in a good way. And by that, I mean, I don't know exactly what all the rules are. I'm not even sure if the characters in the show understand the rules because Ellie was bitten by one of these zombies, but she has not turned. Her wound is healed and she has not turned. So, so for some reason, her blood, she is unaffected by these new fungi infused zombies. I'm sure I'm fungi infused is a weird way of putting it, but that's what I'm going with. And what I like is I don't know exactly what the rules are. I mean, the rules of most zombie movies are you get bit, eventually you're going to turn into a zombie. The only way to, to get rid of a zombie is to get him in the head, get him in the head by any means necessary. And some of those rules apply here, but the rules are different. I love the, Oh, I lost Alan. I lost Alan. He'll be back. I'm sure he clicked on something accidentally. But, but, I, but I love the fact that the rules in this world are different. In addition, these zombies take on different forms. And what we saw in this episode were these two, it's in the thumbnail, but you'll see these, these zombies whose heads have been completely taken over in some sort of bizarre mushroom form. Uh, it's, it's really distressing. So I, what I what I didn't understand, which is also one of the things I love about zombie movies is zombie movies and television shows is, oh, why are you doing that? Why are you going that way? This is a better way to handle that situation. Um, I'm not going to get into too many spoilers here, but uh, I really love this second episode. It set up events that are going to happen in the future. There was a sense of loss in the show. Um, I love heroic acts of self-sacrifice. Um, these are the characters that I tend to, I tend to really identify with. So um, really enjoyed the second episode, loved it. And I'm curious to see where it's going. And I will continue to play the video game. What I've been doing now is uh, I've been watching a movie and then it's sort of late, like 10 o'clock, you know, 11 o'clock. Then I'll sort of get in a couple hours of, playing last of us. So, uh, that's where I'm at. I love it. Let's, uh, I got to find out what's going to, what's happened with Alan. My internet cut out. Um, oh shoot. Uh, <laughs> sorry. All right. Alan's internet is out. Um, We're going we're gonna to get Alan back, but I'm going to go to your chat questions and comments here. So let me do that right now. I'm just, I know, and uh, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, <laughs> you have to bear with me. I've got no Alan. I've got no mod. It's Gore Solo here. 
MK Solid 82 for Buck 99. All Alan needs is a stuffed animal. Uh, Red Terror 1978. He was a member. Diverse opinions, right and wrong. I'll go with that. I'll go with that. I am going to go to the chat here. Chris, keep the party going, says super, superhero movies are the best movies. 10 seconds, Alan, <laughs> says Kyle Ackerman. Uh, there you go. Tell us about Wandering Earth. I will. Alan is infected, says, how's your father? Murdoch 86 says, Alan cut the blue wire. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yes, E. Clay Thomason. Yes. Um, we're going to, we're going to stick with, uh, mostly, uh, last of us questions and comments here. E. Clay Thomason says they have a hive mind. So I wouldn't say they're like zombies. Well, it is zombie like, but with different rules. That's why I'm enjoying the show because I'm learning these rules. Hey, Alan. Hey, speak to me, Alan. Hey, can you, I, I can, can hear you hear you. me at all? Or how's the audio? Audio is okay, great. I, I'm going to not do video. Okay, I'm going to not do video then. Okay, good. Wow, you can do... You know what's great about what you're doing right now? I mean, if you wanted to, you could totally do this this show shirtless. Alan, I yeah, want I need a bigger bra. I need to commend you on all the great work that you've done in the gym since 2023 <laughs> has just started. But yeah, E. Clay Thomason. I mean, yeah, it's it. I, I love that that they can kind of that the roots communicate with each other. So one hive here can communicate with another hive in another place, or communicate with other uh, fungi infused zombies. Uh, look, I'm just getting into it. the The show is rolling out the rules, and I'm learning. I'm sure everyone who's completed The Last of Us. Uh, you know, knows all these rules, but before we do more, so chat, you I'm said, yeah, the question I have is, uh, you're playing the game. Are you ahead of this point or is it following the, no, I'm, the game? I'm right, around, I'm, right, I'm right around the same time. I'm right around the same time. It's like Ellie and Joel have embarked on their journey and they've run into a, a hive. Right. So, so I'm kind of around the same place yeah. and the gameplay has got to be 40 hours. So there you go. A uh, jinx. Yeah. Alan has bigger tits than me, says Jinx. Well, thank you. You're for jealous. That. Yeah. Flaccid Phoenix. Alan is getting hotter. And CD Stein 69. So far, so good. Not perfect, but decent. As for the game, just stick with the first one. The Last of Us 2 is a disappointment. Woke story injected and gameplay a complete downgrade. I have heard this from everyone. There is not one person that's a fan <laughs> of the game that hasn't told me, don't play part two. So I will take that advice. Alan, what did you think of The Last of Us, uh, episode two? Yeah. I mean, I will say uh, the production values on this show is amazing. Uh, it looks beautiful. And, and you know, a lot of times when you watch these zombie shows, they're all at night. And to see this environment in the daytime, uh, I'm like, man, they're, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what their budget is, but this, this show looks incredible. The whole, um, you know, where they're they're looking out over some building and there's all the dead bodies out there, and then they start moving, uh, creepy as hell. Um, I, I do like the the opening scene, this kind of interaction between uh, Joel, Ellie, and I, I guess we're gonna call her Tess at the moment. Um, <laughs> you know, it it's you know this there's still this conflict that I like going on. My only problem is that um, we kind of know. I, I think as an audience, we know. I think we're we're ahead of the story at the moment. Yes. You know, we kind of know what Ellie's what Ellie's purpose is. And um and we know eventually, you know, it's it's like uh you know, will they won't they? You know, th there's a point where we know that they're going to, you know, that they're going to become true allies to each other. Um and so, you know, I I like the progression of it. Now my question is, you know, when is the story going to catch up with with me story-wise? Yeah. Uh, well, I, that, that's the thing is, I think what a lot of people are saying, I mean, it's like, you can see where it's going. Like, they don't like each other. She's this kid mm -hmm. who's, and, and I'm like, yeah, they're going to bond. 
they're going to bond. He's going to, they set it up with his, you know, the loss of his daughter in the first episode. It's like, of course, he's going to bond with a young girl who is around his daughter's age when she tragically died. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and but, and but, so it's, it's kind of like, what is the adventure to get us there? And, you know, are, are we, it's going to be, feel, feel labored along the way or how exciting. And, and I think this was a good step forward. Again, you know, I with this show, I have to go episode by episode, and episode two is definitely going to get me to episode three. Well, no, based on what I've seen so far, I mean, I'm 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 in for the season, and I'm going to continue to play the game. I'm I'm pretty sure I'll finish the game, you know, before the season is done. But uh, I just like the like you were saying, the production design. They go into this library, and it's just, I mean, it, there's so many things about the show, like. They spent a yeah. lot of money on the show, not just digital enhancement, right? The city's digital, but um, wow. Like I, I really like where this is going. It's different. I thought of, I, at first I thought, Oh God, I don't want to do, I don't want to watch this. It's just going to be like the walking dead, but I feel like these shows, they need an end. There is one story being told. Mm -hmm. This is not going to go eight seasons, right? There's one yeah. story being told. It's the relationship between Joel and Ellie and how that plays out and what Joel's decisions along the way, how they're, they're, they're obviously going to encounter other characters. And I'm, I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see it. Uh, let's go to some final comments here and then we're going to switch gears and talk about some other films. Uh, just a few comments. Jinx says last of us part two is like watching Dexter after season four. You can stop at last of us part one, Chris. Well, thank you, Jinx. I'm going to take that advice. Um, I'm not going to play. I, well, well, although Shuxi says, <laughs> I want Chris to play Last of Us Part Two just have a legendary gore rant. That may that may end up happening. But, um, you know, my hope is, is that. The yeah, but I think you're a couple of years too late on that. <laughs> right. My hope is, is that the filmmakers recognize that the audience did not like Last of Us Part Two, the game. And they will steer clear of main story points from that. Because if it goes that way, I think the show will, from what I know, which uh, I, I won't say spoilers for people that don't know, but um, I know the two main events that happen that piss people off, and I don't understand why you would do that. I don't understand why you would do that. You built this audience that is invested in these characters, and why you would do that is moronic. It's like stabbing Han Solo in the chest with a lightsaber in a pointless death in the middle of the new Star <laughs> Wars sequel before he's had the chance to have any interaction with his friends. Utterly stupid and ridiculous. Um, Raylo Normi, I like that name, who's a member, thank you. I refuse to start this show because I know all roads lead to Abby. I don't want to relive the disappointment. Well, I do think it's important to just keep up with like kind of how people are enjoying it because I believe that when they get to season two, they're probably going to divert dramatically and it'll be controversial and it'll be for, I, I think it, it'll, it'll be a good choice. The CGI is really well blended, says Stephen McGill. I agree. The effects in the show are awesome. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume Abby is a spoiler. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, right. uh, so we'll just sort of keep that keep that on the down low. Alan, are you trying to join again? Yes. Is your yeah. internet back? Just, my inter yeah, my internet's back. Wait, can we have two Alans? Oh, no, my I'm almost. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, okay, uh, we're we're echoing here. We're echoing. Uh, hold on. <laughs> uh, I'll bring Alan back when he's fixed it. Let me know when you fixed it, Alan. All right, let's pivot. Oops. <laughs> all right, yeah. We Yay, did. all right. <laughs> uh, Alan Seption. Yeah, you know, they came out and they fixed my internet yesterday. That's great. Yeah, AT&T is the best. Well, uh, I just want to say I appreciate our our audience, everyone in the chat, for tolerating Alan's bad internet. But look, I for one am like I'm all in on the game. I will finish Last of Us, uh, the first game, and uh, I'm at least in for the season because I want to see where it goes. If it goes where I think it's going to go, uh, 
I don't know. Not I, 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 I don't know how that was. I don't know why they thought that was a good choice for the game or for the fans of the show. And Imperfect says, circle back. <laughs> All right. All right. Switching gears here. Let's switch to something else. A horror film that is controversial that I don't think you saw, Alan. I did not see it. Okay. Uh, Skin of Marink is about two kids who wake up in a house and they their their parents are missing. They can't find their parents. Uh, the windows are gone and the doors are gone. It's weird. And you see from the point of view of the kids, and by point of view, I see it's almost like a video game in Skin of Marink. You see the backs of the kids' heads and you're kind of going around the house and you hear noises in the house and you hear the kids asking questions, talking to someone. Uh, and the thing about this movie is that it is not a traditional narrative film. It came out from IFC Films. I'm going to assume IFC Midnight, which is their horror branch. And Skin of Marink is an hour and 40 minute experimental film that seems to lack a story on the surface and kind of requi it requires the viewer to read in things that may or may not be there. Now, I, I, uh, I didn't see the movie in a theater. Um, I saw it on, on video uh, on my, I have a decent television, de decent setup, but my friends who saw it in the, in the theater hated this film, hated the movie. Uh, in fact, half the people that went to see it in my movie meetup group walked out of the movie. And if you look at the ratings, it's got a 2.2 on IMDb and it's divisive. It's mostly one star ratings. And then I'd say about half of that are five star ratings. This is another one of those movies like Babylon that you're either going to love or hate. Um, and I'm in the mind of, I kind of really enjoyed this film. But here's the problem is the way that the film is being sold as a work of genius, brilliant, rush out and see it in the theater. No, there is one proper way to see this movie because what I, what I, what I enjoyed about the film is the fact that it doesn't tell you what's going on. It doesn't really explain things or lead you around. There isn't a story. And I, I've just, having watched experimental films at film festivals for years, I appreciated the sort of, you know, abstract nature of the movie. Uh, all the footage is very grainy. You see suddenly they're on the ceiling. What is going on? You hear voices. And I've seen videos that try to explain some sort of conspiracy theory or not conspiracy theory, but a theory about what's actually going on in the movie. I don't think any of them are right. I think whatever you think is going on in the movie, that's your interpretation. I kind of think that that's what the filmmaker intended was. You decide what the movie's about. I don't know. Some have even suggested that the movie is kind of like Beetlejuice in the sense that there is the, the living world on one end. And then on the other end is the disembodied world of the dead and the children in the children in Skinamarink are either dead and don't know it. They're either and they're not dead and they're talking to their their you know recently deceased parents from the other side, the spirit world, or they're talking to a demon that's trying to lure them into this other realm. And I I really I look, I'm not gonna tell you it's the greatest movie ever. I'm telling you, once I sort of gave into the fact that this is an experimental abstract film, not a traditional horror movie, there's not like jump scares, there's not like, you know, there could be things considered jump scares, there's not a typical story, and there's not even a narrative that you can figure out. This movie, and I'll tell you, this is the best way to experience this movie. Listen to me. The best way to experience Skin and Marink is not to see it at the movies. The best way to experience Skin and Rink is not to watch it on your television at seven at night. The best way to experience Skin and Rink, and this is the Skin and Rink challenge, put this movie on before you go to bed. There's a lot of videos that if I'm having trouble sleeping, I'll put on these videos that are just pitch black, but you hear the sound of rain and they're like eight hours and I'll wake up or the sound of waves crashing, like these sort of, uh, uh, I'm going to use this word wrong. Is it somnambulistic? Like, like psalm meaning sleep, somnambulistic. I can't look it up right now. 
Um, any case, it, it sort of lulls you to sleep. Skin a if you put it on, put it on at midnight or one in the morning before you go to bed. And then what's here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna wake up in the middle of the night and you're going to see other things happening on the screen and it's going to freak you out. When I was a kid, and not everyone's gonna relate to this. When I was a kid, I used to watch movie monster movies late night on television. I tried to stay up to watch Saturday Night Live. I wanted to stay up past 11 p.m. It was like a challenge when you're like seven years old, eight years old. But the thing that scared me was waking up in the middle of the night to a fuzzy screen because TV was gone. The day was over. And that's what this movie plays on. It plays on this primal instinct of things that we fear and the fact that nothing is explained in this movie. This is not a spoiler. It could be considered a spoiler. And this movie's not rated, by the way. It's not rated R. It's not, uh, it's, it doesn't tell you what's going on. It doesn't explain anything. It's completely bizarre and abstract. And the fact that you could just put this movie on late at night and wake up later and you're like, what the hell's going on? It will freak you out in the same way that a fuzzy television screen freaked me out as a kid. It plays on that. Also the sound design. And there are a couple shots where you're like, what am I seeing? Is this a gateway to hell? Like it doesn't tell you anything. And that I love about it. This movie is not for everybody. So this is a warning. While I'm telling you, I really enjoyed the film because I think that I understood what the filmmaker was trying to tap into, which is this bizarre experimental experience. It's more of an experience. This isn't a movie. I think it was a huge mistake to open this movie in the theaters um, I, I, because I don't think it plays well in the theater, but putting it on late, late at night before going to bed will blow your mind and freak you out. Let's go to uh, let's go to thoughts in the uh, chat. I'll just say you've you've not sold me on this movie at all. Well, that's no. Uh, I'm yeah. I'm saying it's a warning. Th this is what this. Yeah. Movie but man, it's it's like it's, it's if you're gonna make me see a horror film, I, I don't want to have to keep working for it, you know. And I feel like for me to figure out this movie and what's going on is is a lot of work. And uh, you know, I. I'll grant that in some cases, but you know, at some, at some point, you know, you do just want to go to the movie to kind of check out and, you know, and, and have a story kind of be told to you as opposed to figuring it out uh, in a way that doesn't feel like it solves it at all or that but there's a resolution. Here's the problem. The filmmakers didn't sell it like this. All they sold it with was quotes. Yeah. They sold it with quotes. And I think that's such a, that's such a huge mistake to sell it with like the greatest horror movie. And I, I'm seeing these quotes and I know some of these outlets and I'm like, bullshit, bullshit. It's not that it is literally like um, a screensaver that will freak you out. A screensaver that'll just blow your mind and freak you out. So I want to know, first of all, great t-shirt today, Alan. Oh, thanks. Great t-shirt. Let me go to um, the comments here. David Glenn says, Skinamarink looks like a cross between the Blair Witch Project and those god-awful German art house films. You are exactly right. You are 100% right. The description doesn't help sell it. That's a nope for me. Totally respect mm -hmm. that. That's like saying, you know, do you like pineapple on pizza? This is a very divisive thing. Pineapple, ham and pineapple... Um, and there was a there was a place in Pasadena they since shut down since the before times um, that used to do this rosemary ham with pineapple. It was my favorite pizza that they made. So um, it's it's not for everybody. That's why I'm giving you a warning. I enjoyed it because I figured out what this is. It's a screensaver you put on before you go to bed that'll that'll freak you out. It's not, it's not a traditional horror movie and selling it that way was a big mistake. Alan Horkin says, are we supposed to understand what the title Skinamarink means? Um, no, but I remember a song when I was a child that we sang in elementary school. Does anyone remember this song? I know the song, but thankfully no one ever made me sing it. <laughs> okay. In elementary school, I sang the song. It was Skinamarink a rink a dink Skinamarink a do. It's just a childhood song. I don't know what it means. Yeah. Um, Reba Ibn Muhammad says, Skinamarink is so bad. It is more like a video art project from high schoolers. That is an, that is an accurate description. Mm -hmm. In spite of that, 
I enjoyed it because I understood like, oh, this movie's trying to fucking scare the shit out of me because I'm supposed to like fall asleep watching it because it is sort of has a lulling effect. Meaning this movie is intended to make you fall asleep on purpose. It is, it is almost, it's like a magic trip trick or a, a hypnosis. I know I'm not selling it well. What I'm, <laughs> yeah. what I'm doing is I'm trying to give you a warning about what this movie is to give you a better expectation about what the movie is. So when you go into it, if you choose to do that, you'll have a better understanding of what the film is. So you're not disappointed because it's not smile. It's not a jump scare, scary movie with its high concept. That's smile, yeah. which is a decent horror film uh, in its own right. But Skin of Rink is not that. Pirate. I, I think the encouragement here is that anyone can make a movie and IFC will buy it, and then IFC will put it in the movie theater. So, uh, you know, I I don't know the history of it, but it, it sounds like it sounds very indie to me. And uh, it's very, you know, indie. And we appreciate IFC buying those films and putting them in theaters. Well, someone had a marketing plan for this, and I think it's mm -hmm. interesting. It's still playing in theaters, which is kind of shocking. Pirate Queen for Buck ninety nine says, "Will you be reviewing Banshees of Inisherin?" We did review it. Alan we, no, we never reviewed it. Are you sure? I thought you reviewed it. Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen it because uh, I have a, I have a hard time with with the language. But here's what we're gonna do. Here's a, just where uh, it's on HBO Max right yeah. now. You can watch it with the closed captioning on. Here's what we're gonna do, Alan. We will do a roundup show where we will re-review all of the movies nominated for Best Picture. Okay. How about that? Yeah. And Pirate Queen, we will do that because you asked. Uh, we're going to do that. I'm skipping Skinamarink, said superhero movies are the best movies. Shuxi <laughs> says, if I'm high enough, I'll consider watching Skinamarink. Oh, yeah, it sounds like it. you need to be in that state to do that. To if you it. are high and you watch Skinamarink, I think you will enjoy it. Robert Kearney for Buck 99 says, my wife is with Alan, just wants to check out. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to watch a movie constantly saying what the hell is going on. <laughs> you know, I... I, and I and I hate to say, it, but I, I I say this to a lot of indie filmmakers. You you got to understand you've you you're literally carrying the audience along in your movie, and if you lose them at any point, they're gone and and they they won't come back, and they'll they they'll disengage from your movie uh, midway through. Well, I, I'm just saying that I think that they sold it incorrectly, kind of like the movie Babylon. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like Babylon was a terrible marketing, terrible marketing. Um, no, I think it was. I think it was accurate to what it was. It's just no, it, it didn't. Good. But it didn't. It was It didn't put it in context. All right, Winter Soldier, yeah. who's a Winter's Soldier, who's a member, says Skinamarink a dink a dink, Skinamarink a do. I love you, Skinamarink a dink a dink, Skinamarink a do. I love you, and underneath the moon. And it goes on. The song goes on like that. It's like it a sounds creepy, like a horror film to me. It's it sounds like a creepy kid song. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it just is a creepy kid song. I mean, if you if you think about "Ring Around the Rosy," that that could be a horror film in its in and of itself. These songs they made us at least when I was in school. Now it's sort of like it's the non-binary song. You could be the is that what they're teaching kids now in school? That's if if you uh, watch libs of TikTok, you pretty much. That's that's what's happening in every single school in the country. I don't believe that that's happening. And uh, oh yeah, and then Lord Thoth going on. I love you in the morning and in the afternoon. I love you in the evening underneath the moon. Yeah, that's the song. I okay, that was a song I sang as a kid in elementary school. A lot of the songs oh, we sang people, were. I tell you, <laughs> Tara. What can I say? <laughs> I grew up in Michigan. Ah, uh, these these songs. All right. Well, skin a rink a movie to watch high or right before you go to bed, put the movie as you are falling asleep. I'm not joking when I say this. I think it will increase your, your enjoyment of the film because it's not a horror movie that you just sit and watch. You will be bored if you sit and watch Skin and Marine. But if you sort of just allow it to play out like a, like a screensaver that freaks you out and play it really loud. Ribbon, it, Rid uh, Ibn Muhammad has just become a YouTube member. Thank you for that. Yeah, All right. You. We're going to pivot and switch gears here. We're going to pivot, Alan. We're pivoting. We're pivoting really quickly. It's Chinese New Year. It's Chinese New Year. And 
in 2019, uh, during Chinese New Year, I went to the theater and saw a film in Chinese. It's uh, with English subtitles. It was the biggest science fiction film in China at the time called The Wandering Earth. The Wandering Earth is about a cataclysm that's happening on Earth. The sun is expanding in size and is putting Earth in danger of just being destroyed. So what happens? The world unites to construct these giant power generators that are going to move the Earth out of its orbit into a place that is away from the sun in uh, closer to Jupiter. That's the story of the first wandering earth. Um, and they have these giant arc reactors that take up like a whole city is one, uh, one reactor that it looks like, it looks like what's on the back of the star destroyer, you know, from the original star Wars, those, those engines, these sort of glowing sort of engines um, it looks like a sort of a half sphere that that is powered. But what happens is the story of the first wandering Earth is one of the arc reactors isn't working and a group of just regular citizens have to go underneath and restart the reactor so the Earth can be moved out of moved to safety into orbit uh, around Jupiter. That is the story of the first wandering Earth. And it was huge. It's a uh, very, very much. Um, you see the the Chinese pride in this. It's very heroic. Um, I think there's one character that's a white guy that's Australian in the first movie, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It's based on a novel. I'm trying to find the name. Can you look that up, Alan? The name of the the author of the novel. But the first Wandering Earth movie is currently on Netflix. I strongly recommend it. It's a straight up action movie about a bunch of people, normal citizens who want to save the planet um, by going into this reactor, restarting it as a way to move earth to safety. Uh, it's kind of wild. Like what actually happens if we move out of earth, earth's orbit, will we be getting enough energy from the sun to sustain our planet? So there's a, a, an environmental message, but it's not too heavy. There's also a, a message about duty to future generations. There's a, a great relationship between a grandfather um, and grandkids in the, in the first wandering earth that I found very heartwarming. It's, it's a straight up action movie. It's like Michael Bay in, in Chinese is what the first wandering earth is. The Wandering Earth 2 is a direct sequel to The Wandering Earth 1, where the Earth is now put in more uh, danger when the moon ends up is is it's kind of a it's kind of a ripoff of Moonfall, to be honest, where the moon is crumbling and will crash on Earth, and they have to move the Earth away far enough from the moon so that the moon doesn't crash into Earth, murdering everybody. In addition, they've got to take this, you know, these engines have to then propel the wandering Earth into another solar system, Alpha Centauri, and the journey will take 2,500 years or 100 generations. Um, I didn't like the wandering Earth 2 as much as, as much as wandering Earth 1. The wandering Earth 2 almost comes off, like parts of it come off like a documentary. It starts off with these terrorists that are trying to destroy this. Basically, it's like an elevator that takes you above Earth's orbit, Earth's uh, uh, atmosphere. And they use it to get to space stations and do all sorts of outer space. But there's a, it's literally, rather than rocket ships, they have a giant elevator that goes beyond the atmosphere. And some terrorists sabotage it. It's a, The opening action scene with drones is crazy. It's so good. It's the first like 20, almost 30 minutes of the movie is this intense action set piece uh, for The Wandering Earth 2. And then you meet like government officials and the head of China at the time. And it takes you all the way through like 2040. And it's a similar adventure where they have to send a bunch of intrepid astronauts to the moon to, to uh, set explosives. That's kind of the the, the action in the second half of the movie. They've got to get these explosives on the moon, just enough of them to, to vaporize it so it's out of harm's way of Earth. Um, another sort of epic scale, I just didn't like it as much as the first Wandering Earth, which felt like a, it felt like a straight up Michael Bay action movie. This movie felt a little bit 
too political because it got into the politics of different countries, like America's doing this, and then the Chinese are doing this. And the Russians, and what's weird, the Russians are working with the Chinese and they they like want to sort of, it, it's, there's some weird political interplay here. It's not so much like lecturing and like hit you over the head, but it's like, oh, okay. I mean, this stuff happens in, it happens in other action movies. I just thought it was a little more than the first one where it wasn't so political. Like Earth was kind of united in the Wandering Earth Project. Um, it's a fascinating sci-fi uh, concept. It's incredibly ambitious. I'm strongly recommending The Wandering Earth on Netflix and Wandering Earth 2. If it's playing near you, it's actually at, um, Alan, if you want to see it, it's at AMC Theaters and it's okay. at the, the Regal. It's at Regal and AMC. Yeah, I remember the Wandering Earth being at AMC. The, the, I remember when I read the description of Wandering Earth, the thing that caught my mind or the thing I thought about was, well, the Earth needs to rotate in order to maintain gravity. And if you strap rockets to the Earth, doesn't that affect the way it rotates? And then doesn't that cause more problems? Okay. Alan, the other thing is questions, Alan. Too many questions, but, Alan. But, 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 but the thing about wondering too, it, it, the when I knew you were gonna talk about this, it, it reminded me of Train to Busan and Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Train to Busan is a great zombie movie on a train, and then they followed up with Peninsula, which was basically, you know, uh, Walking Dead. You know, one of the, takes place in, in a town or something like that. Well, and, and I'm like, it, it is like, it felt like, are we going to get the same thing where it's a huge departure from the first movie? Uh, first of all, you're exactly right. And that is, that could not be a better description because mm -hmm. Train to Busan is awesome. Great zombie movie. Haven't seen anything like it. It's different. I really enjoyed it. And then Peninsula is like, tries to ground it in, here's what the world is now. Yeah, yeah. Now that there are zombies, here how here's how things function. There's sort of this like, you know, uh, illegal economy. And, and it's just weird. This is how people survive. And Wandering Earth 2 does exactly that. It's like, here's how Earthlings now have, have learned to cope on a basically... Uh, a, a giant starship that happens to also be the planet earth. It's a little like nonsensical. They don't really stop long enough to tell you about the science of how this would even work. I, I, I know that it goes into more detail in the novel. I just like the ambitiousness of this. Like, like we're not getting this kind of science fiction in, you know, in America. Like what is the big science fiction movie that people are trying to do? I mean, they're just not, you know, they're not, they're not doing that. And so I, you know, in spite of like Wandering Earth 2, mild recommendation to see it in mm -hmm. theaters. Um, if you can see it, check it out. But definitely check out The Wandering Earth, which is on Netflix now, because it's just straight yeah. up an action movie with this high, high sci-fi concept. Let's go. Okay, to so let me let me get to your, your novel uh, question. Uh, it's based on uh, three novels. Yes. Uh, the first novel is The Wandering Earth. The one you saw, Wandering Earth 2, is based on Supernova Era. And then there's a third novel called The Micro Age, which I assume if there's a third movie, it'll be based on that one. I, I assume it'll end up being a trilogy. Let's go to, yeah. before we bring on the film threat writers talking about Sundance and Slamdance, I want to go to your chat, comments and questions. So let's do that right now. Uh, MK Solid 82 says, can we get footage of Alan playing patty cake? Oh, yeah. Why, why, did you star that, Alan? <laughs> why did you make me read that? <laughs> The answer to that is no. No, but you can get footage of Alan painting his room and watching it dry. David Glenn says, watch the Wandering Earth 2 trailer. Talk about crisis on a finite Earth. Damn, sucks to be them. The message I took away is not going to sit well with the Twitter mob. All right, well, good. Have your opinion. I like that. Winter's Soldier says, I, I kind of like Wandering Earth and flying the Earth away. Uh, <laughs> Derek Rosenfeld for two. Chris, does it work in a completely empty theater? It wasn't completely empty. Uh, the theater I went to was packed. I think I was the only white guy in the theater because I went to see it at the Santa Anita uh, oh, AMC, yeah. which is <laughs> that cool. explains it. Yeah. What? What's wrong with that? Well, Santa Anita is uh, high, uh, has a large Asian population. Well, you can say that, Alan. I'm not allowed to say that. Um, Pilgrim Media for two says Ring Around the Rosy is about the plague. Oh, wow. Yeah. All those childhood songs are dark. The history of those songs. Thank you, Pilgrim Media, yeah. for that. And all inspirations for horror movies. 
Toxic Waltz N8 says, sounds dumb. Is it any better than Moonfall? Yes, because it takes Moonfall, it takes things much more seriously than Moonfall. Davina Duckworth, Wallace and Gromit solved the problem with rocketry too. See, <laughs> there you go. Alan with basics physics, Davina goes on to say. War Monkey, it's magic, Alan. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it, Alan. Bill S. Preston Esquire says, listen to the Asian guy for math and science questions. Yeah, that's... I can barely listen to Alan for correct spelling. A spelling has nothing to do with math and science. <laughs> Bethel Game says, no, the Earth doesn't have to rotate for gravity. It is its mass. Ooh, Bethel Games hitting Alan with the science. But doesn't doesn't the uh, orbit around the sun have something to do with it as well? I mean, I, I it's I know it's a conglomeration of a lot of physics, but uh, right. Right. Yeah. Robert Kearney says there is no science in movies. Colon Armageddon. Well, I would agree with that. I would agree. I would agree. But uh, look, I'm just gonna say I I I really enjoyed the first Wandering Earth. I didn't enjoy the Wandering Earth two as much because I thought it just got muddled in this sort of political. It kind of starts. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it picks up where the last one left off a few years later, and then it goes all the way to like, you know, it just gives you these giant dates and kind of tells you what's going on. And it just seems like it's sort of mixed in sort of documentary techniques. Um, and it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. So uh, there you go. But let's let's switch gears here. And look, we've got over. You know how many people are in the chat right now, Alan? Yes, I do. <laughs> Can you say it, Alan, for me? It's you want four... me to say it or are you going to play the video? It's There's it, two people Look, in the chat. Or, there's 469. 469. People watching live <laughs> right now. It actually just went up 473. So I just want to say to everybody watching, we appreciate you watching us, growing our audience. Thank you for all your super chats. We appreciate it. Um and uh and 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 there you go so uh you subscribe to, and here's my last thing please subscribe to the channel if you are not subscribed because our our reviews our reviews are just holy fucking shit these reviews are delicious and if you su support the channel you get to see some <laughs> Oh, my, my jeans. That's not the video I meant to play. <laughs> oh, wow. All right, folks, we have 500 people watching live. Now it's time to see the people behind the scenes. We talk about the Film Threat website. Maybe you could go to the website right now, Alan. Let's check out the Film Threat website. Um, if you go to filmthreat.com on a daily basis, you're going to read new movie reviews every day. Indie films, movies playing in theaters. Uh, during the time of Sundance and Slamdance, we get super busy. Why? We're, you know, collectively covering about 20 movies a day. And if you go to filmthreat.com right now, you will see new movies from our intrep new movie reviews from our intrepid group of writers. I think we've got about six or eight people currently uh, covering Sundance and Slam Dance right now. And I'm so pleased to bring them on the show. Wait, let me, I've got a, let's see. Let me, let me bring them on here. Here we go. All right. It's time, folks. It's time for us to cover the Sundance Film Festival. Let me introduce to you uh, the writers who work their work work incredibly difficulty. Dif they work incredibly hard during this period of the year. And I want to bring on, I'm going to bring them on one by one. I want to bring on Sabina Dana Plasse. Uh, Sabina, how's it going? It's good. It's good to see you guys. You look good. Yeah. You look good as you, well. You made it back. <laughs> Sabina was at Park City. Uh, she's Sab home now, I believe. Sabina's currently in an empty warehouse. Yes. Which, here, which explains the echo. But uh, you know? just want to let you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you might want to, there something? you go. It's fine. Um, Sabina, before before we start talking about movies, what I want to get is I want to get your take 
on what has been happening in Park City, Utah. You had some thoughts about the Sundance Film Festival. So I want to hear your thoughts before we get into specific uh, film reviews. Yeah, yeah. So how's that sound? Okay, we good? It sounds good. It's a, like I say, it's kind of echoey. Uh, uh, yeah, but um, it's, it's not much we can do. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, I live out in the Mountain West, which is I'm about four hours north of Park City. And um, prior to that, I've been traveling around the country for the last two years during the pandemic. But besides that, the whole world moved to these mountain towns. <laughs> Anyone with any, any money left where they were, kept their house, and they moved to mountain town. Park City was is definitely one of them. And it was a place growing already before the pandemic. So arriving at Sundance this year, um, it was an enormous crowd of people. It was skiers, it was new people living there, and the festival. And I'm sure you guys know this better than anyone. Coming out of the pandemic, everything is rusty, trying to get back in order, trying to find the lane that you've been in all this time, it's not the same. Um, and my, and it was freezing and it's still freezing. Um, like the coldest Sundance I've ever been to in the last- Let me, let me, let me years. cut to the chase. What is, how is Sundance different now after two years of being virtual? Um, so less information that people, People just weren't with it. That there was a lot of misinformation. People who didn't know things, they knew the wrong things. They couldn't get the bus system in order, um, and it just uh, Wi-Fi horrible. The the app you're using for your tickets, it's now scanning. You don't really need paper tickets anymore. The coolest part about that app, though, is the transfer thing. Like you can give tickets to anyone at any time who's on the app, which I love but the whole freaking world is on there with you. So uh, you couldn't upload, do anything. It worked five seconds before you got in the theater and your phone froze and cold. Oh, bottom line, what I heard is everybody had bad experiences waiting in line for things. The app didn't completely function accurately. Wi-Fi was terrible. Horrible. Traffic was terrible. So if you wanted to get from one theater to the other. Uh, and, oh. and also I heard from other people that it was kind of deserted because most journalists this year opted to not attend in person. They decided to um, just go the virtual route and watch movies virtually. So I'm just trying to like, cause yeah. uh, we've got, we've got like four other writers that are waiting in the wings. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to, I want to keep the conversation going. Oh yeah, It was a hustle. Cool. Is that accurate? Is that an accurate description of like what's happening? I mean, so let me, uh, in the beginning, yes. And it's a hustle. It's always a hustle at Sundance. And that's just the way it is. It is, it was still sold out. Every freaking screening I went to was sold out with wait lists and the whole deal. So mm -hmm. it's still Sundance in terms of seeing it in person. The only difference is, yeah, you didn't have the journalists that you normally have. Like I was asked to come on to press lines. I was, I was like, I was just waiting to see movies. And they're like, you're press, come interview us. Like, was, <laughs> like I got to meet Ruth Reichel at the land uh, in uh, food and country. It was awesome. Like I had a role to myself. Um, and you should know anytime I showed up for a press line, people were like film threat. They love film threat. Everyone was so happy to see the name film threat. And that felt pretty good. You guys, I have to say, um, because the rest of the festival, you're on your own. You are digging in. It's it was cold. It was snowy. The snowy part was better than, and um, it was tough. They were not organized. Um, but I did not see a film I didn't like. All right. Well, that's it's. They say it's the mountain air. They say it's the mountain <laughs> air. So, because um, I, I will say this, like I've seen movies in Park City at Sundance where it was like packed. It was hard to get in. You go see the movie. The There's an electricity in the air. No one knows anything about this movie except for a poorly written description in the festival program guide, which doesn't even accurately represent the movie. I, I my, my red flag word is whenever I see the word earnest, mm. I usually don't go see that movie. Mm. Um, but like you, so you don't even know what the movie's about because it's so, there's one still from the film. There's no, there's barely posters or marketing. So you're seeing a film untainted by the marketing because you haven't been told what to think about it yet. So then you go and you see it and it's packed. Um, there's usually a standing ovation because I can't believe they finished a movie. So you're all happy because you're there. The, the the filmmakers and the actors get up and they give a speech, you know, a Q&A that's very enthusiastic. And I'll walk away going, wow, that was awesome. And then a year or two later, I'll see the exact same movie again like on television. And I'm like, 
why the fuck did I like that movie? It was a piece of shit. That's so uh, that movie was <laughs> fucking awful. Why did I like that? It was so I, dumb. You know, and you guys know I, I, I've got quite a few film reviews to write, and I've been thinking about them all day because I just literally got back. And um, um, they're sitting with me. I'm sorry. Like, I, I'm the first person to say, no way. That sucked. What are they doing? What a waste of money, my time, my effort. Um, and I, I was like, there's people are happy to be making movies. They're happy to make independent movies. And it was so good to be with an audience that you could randomly talk to anyone because you're at a film festival. You're all there with a common purpose. And that felt pretty good. I'm not going to lie. Like randomly having conversations and then you'll never see that person again. It still felt great. Um, well, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I'm just saying that there is something about context, oh, and yeah. pres context and presentation, context and presentation matters. Like how an audience sees a movie or oh. if you're like buying the merch and whatnot. So uh, I think that's fine. But I always sort of like when I see incredibly enthusiastic reviews come out of Sundance and I know this just from going for years, I always kind of like dial it back a little bit. So yeah, some quick comments before we bring on our other writers. We're going to have you each individually review a film. I, I don't know that we'll have enough time for everybody to review everything, but we'll review as many as we possibly can over the next hour. First of all, Malcolm Taylor became a, a YouTube member. Thank you for that. We appreciate your support. It's okay to laugh says, will you be reviewing the Slam Dance episodes or just films? Probably just films. Yeah. Yeah, probably just films at this point. Unless if you go to filmthreat.com uh, on the upper right corner, you can submit something uh, to review if you would like us to review it. And Eric Stratton for 777, who's also a member, says, don't even like indie movies that much, but read many of your Sundance written reviews. Great stuff, well-written, and made me want to watch some. See? See, yes. you, gotta, you gotta break out of that Star Wars, Disney, Pixar, Marvel. Break out from that. You gotta, you gotta just going seeing an indie movie. It's kind of like, like, look, I know I eat McDonald's every day, which is going to the movie theater to see a mainstream movie. I think I would like to try something else. Solomon Thornton says, "Greetings, Madam Sabina." Ooh, that must be a uh, hail Sabina, says Lord Thoth. <laughs> David Glenn says, "How was the? But how was the food? What food? Oh, <laughs> you don't have time to eat. food at Sunday. The options there are horrible. It was the really bad this year. It was worse than ever. Yeah, it's yeah. awful. Um, Winter Soldier says, "Please tell us about the amazing Maurice. Hmm. Did you see it? I did not see. Has anyone movie. seen that film? No, it's not available to us. Yeah. Online. It's not okay. Well, that movie's opening in theaters anyways in a couple of weeks. That was the one that kind of set me off and pissed me off." Because why is this movie that's opening on February 3rd, the same day as Knock at the Cat, Knock at the Cabin? Like, why is that movie opening um, at Sundance? Like, that's another slot for a small indie filmmaker. And it kind of so so look, I'm not I'm kind of soft on Sundance now from the standpoint of I feel like um, after the last couple of years of virtual only um, and, and the festival kind of going through some changes, I will say that I am encouraged that Eugene Hernandez from IndieWire, uh, he's one of the founders of IndieWire, is actually taking over next year. I know he's involved with this year. Yes. And I, I, I think he has impeccable taste. Yeah. I think that will help the festival. Um, yeah. Let's bring on a bunch of our other writers and we're gonna have you individually. Sabina, you have to leave early, right? No, no. Well, Alex has to leave early. Alex has to leave early. Oh, All right, we're gonna, bring, we're gonna bring everybody on one by one and you have no idea who any of these people are but you will see their names on the Film Threat website. When you go to filmthreat.com, look for their names. It's Alex Savilev here. Alex, how's it going? Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Then we also have, you know, I'm going to do this for a second because I want people to see your names. Then we have Michael Talbot Haynes is joining us. Ben Franz and Jason, Jason yeah, Delgado. Jason, uh, I, I, he's working on his connection there, so. He's got a bad uh, connection. Well, once, would... he stay, once he finds a stable connection, we'll we'll bring him on. All right. Well, Michael, I love your T-shirt. Rocking Thank the red shirt. Love it. Um, let's, let's uh, first of all, um, before we each have you individually review a movie, a uh, quick, in a very quick, give us your just sort of overall impressions of Sundance. We'll start with Alex. 
Uh, echoing Sab Sabina's uh, sentiment, actually, um, I'm a pretty harsh critic, and I tend to kind of elevate the score a little bit for struggling indie filmmakers because I know the struggles that they face. But I don't have to do that this time. I mean, I was just based purely on merit. Uh, I was, you know, I had six films to review. I knocked them all out. Um, they were all they were all pretty great. I mean, even even the worst one I reviewed had some like palpable ambition, and they you could tell like the passion that the filmmaker put into it. So nothing negative to say. And I'd like to uh, also echo your concern that <laughs> I'm kind of having heard her story. I'm kind of glad that I didn't attend the actual <laughs> festival and I did it remotely. Yeah. I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's nothing like sitting at home and your kids are asleep and you have that like the evening descends upon the city and then you're a one on one with the film just you and the laptop or the, the tv screen or whatever it is and you can press pause you can have a drink you can you know have a beer like it's just it's, it's, <laughs> it's warm you know like i just didn't feel like i was missing out at all <laughs> yeah, i mean i felt the same way like i've been there you know, I've been going since I think 96. Um, and I missed a couple of years here and there. I haven't gone the last few years, but yeah, I, um, you know, there's something about that, like constant rush, like of like every night there's like, okay, you're seeing like three movies during the day. If you're lucky, some parties in between, maybe a midnight movie rinse repeat. So it it definitely ends up being something of a grind. Wait, I'm going to, I'm going to fix that in a minute, but yeah, it's, um, uh, the virtual, the vir now. Let me ask: Did they do the land acknowledgments for virtual? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Not for oh. virtual. Right. No, not for virtual, but everywhere. Not I was. for virtual, yeah. but they did land acknowledgments. How does everyone feel about the land acknowledgments? It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's it like a little uncomfortable. Like I don't know. I'm like, you know, a little uncomfortable. Yeah, it's like this used to belong to Navajo. Right. Well, yeah. where are they now? <laughs> right. It's yeah. I mean, if I were white, I'd feel really bad about myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's supposed to. That's what it's supposed, <laughs> yeah. to do. it's supposed to make you feel bad. Uh, it's a perpetual my, state of mind these days. Like I wake up feeling bad, I go to sleep feeling bad. So like it's just nothing. Nothing's gonna make me feel worse than media already does. So. My my house is on stolen land. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just I wanted think to all of ours. Are. I just wonder if they were still doing it. Uh, Michael, what what are your thoughts? Overall impressions, just briefly, before we get into specific reviews. Um, overall impressions about Sundance. Yeah, this Sundance was very unusual for me because um, instead of being given several films to review, I was given um one film that was actually the length of several films to review. Oh no! <laughs> I'm a little uh, um, however, the four and a half hour film was a biography on Willie Nelson. So uh, I'm wow. a happy guy. Oh, that's great. Um, yep. and, and, uh, what, what do you think, uh, uh, Ben? What are your thoughts, too? It was pretty great. Uh, I did it virtually, obviously. And um, the films that I watched were wonderful and strange. And the midnight one was a especially creepy. So yeah, it was, it was a good time. <laughs> That's good to hear. All right, let's go around uh, before we actually get into specific reviews, starting with Sabina, best movie you saw at Sundance, and then we'll get into individual reviews. Deep Rising. Tell us about it. So um, it's a documentary executive produced by Jason Momoa and um, a Swiss documentary di uh, director. He's been at Sundance before. It's about mining the ocean, mining the seafloor for metals and minerals because our world is going to be battery operated and we need a new place to find the uh, substances to help us make batteries. And so the director follows this guy who is raising capital for his mining company. And he goes to all the meetings and you're, and he's talking about how we're not going to upset the environment. And you're like watching these enormous machines get dumped into the ocean to mine the floor, which we know nothing about. And so the, the film juxtaposes Jason Momoa's narration on a subject he is very impassioned about. Plus he has no filter. He was there, no filter. 
and um, gorgeous imagery of life at the deep parts of the ocean, all the things that where we came from. And it's gorgeous. It's actually, it was kind of like a meditation, to be honest. It was beautifully done, really well researched. The guy who's starting this mining company eventually goes public. He reminds me a great deal like the WeWorks. Well, well wait, wait, don't do it. You're you're like doing the full review. I just want to get briefly the best film that you saw. That uh, it was that one. Anyway, let's go to you. What was briefly the best film you saw of the movies you saw at Sundance? Ben. Oh, so the best film I saw was probably Is There Anybody Out There? Oh. Is There Any What? It's called Is There Anybody Out There? Is There Anybody Out There? And What's it about? Tell us. It's about a woman named Ella Glendining mm -hmm. and her life with a particularly fascinating disability in that she was born without hips. And <laughs> apparently this is a condition known as PFFD. I don't remember what all the initials stand for. And it happens in about 0.6% of the population. So one of her grand adventures and the memoir part of this documentary is finding out if there's anybody currently living who shares her condition because her boyfriend and her son definitely don't. So she's interested to see if there's more PFFD sufferers out there without hips. So that was a fascinating thing. Yeah, that one. Alex, what about yourself? That is her body. What was the best thing? I mean, everyone seems like overall people saw a lot of good stuff. Uh, Alex, what was the best thing you saw? Uh, Nicole Holosner's uh, You Hurt My Feelings. It's been a while since she uh, made a film. I think it's been like six, seven years or something. And uh, she's way overdue. Um, in a time where most films are driven, it seems like political ideologies and uh, special effects and whatnot, she still makes films that are character driven. And by that, I mean like, like you really deeply involve yourself immediately from the first frame in the characters' lives. And then you don't want the film to end based purely on the fact that you want to know what happens to the characters next. And that's such a rarity these days in films where it's sort of like, like the main actress is Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And, you know, she's famous for the show Seinfeld, which was a show about nothing. Similarly, this film is sort of a film about nothing, but it's also about everything. She plays a writer, um, an aspiring writer, and she eavesdrops on her husband talking to a friend about how much she, he hates her new book. And that's sort of like the premise for the whole <laughs> film. And then she sort of starts to like, you know, like their, their relationship starts to sag a little bit. Like there's this issue of trust. And also the film explores like the honesty and the dishonesty that we have with each other. Like why are we dishonest with each other when we give each other compliments that we don't mean? Is it out of love? Like ultimately does it do more good than bad? So a lot of interesting themes explored in a very light but deep film. And Michael, you just saw the one film. That is correct. But yeah. honestly, I had seen another film besides Willie Nelson and Family. Willie Nelson and Family would still be the best film um, for just purely because of the scope and purely because so many of us have been waiting decades for this biography on Willie Nelson to be made. All right. Well, let's uh, let's actually start uh, with. So, oh wait, we've got a couple of uh, uh, comments. Yeah, actually, Jason just joined us. Uh, Jason. Uh, oh wait, Jason oh, just joined us. There How's your yeah. internet, Jason? It looks like it sucks. <laughs> uh, it's been terrible. Yeah. That's great. Does. All right. Uh, real quick, Jason Delgado. Best. You. What was your overall impression? And the best. What's the best film that you saw um, of the Sundance screeners you had access to? Uh, well, I've only done uh, Slam Dance so far, but uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, Love Dump. Uh, it's a right, parody, well, we'll, we'll... kind of in the vein of uh, UHF, Weird Al. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about Love Dump later. That's right. You're covering Slam Dance. A couple quick comments and questions here. Sword and Starships for ten says, aka Captain Garrett, Chris Allen, and Film Threat. Your balanced, good natured uh, takes remind me of the Siskel and Ebert days, but way better. Alan, don't let it go to your head. Um, your example inspired me <laughs> as I build my channel, Swords and Starships. Well, thank you, Swords and Starships. And everyone, go subscribe to Swords and Starships 
check out that channel. Davina Duckworth. Hello, Alex, Michael, and Ben. Appreciate that. And, Jason. and uh, Rida Ibn Mohammed. Having all the writers here is amazing. Please do more of this. Great program today. And that was sent in. I think Ben actually posted that wasn't Mohammed. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, folks. But let's get right to it. Let's, um, uh, Alex, I know you have to go. So why don't you, um, and when we talk about these movies, we're not going to have time to go in any great depth. Try to keep the descriptions to just a couple minutes. And then we'll occasionally go for comments and questions. I'm going to feature you uh, larger screen here. But Alex, tell us about the film that, that you would like to review. Um. Uh, well, I mentioned the Nicole Holofs in her film, so that was really good, but I kind of already described it. Uh, another film was Sometimes I Think About Dying, that was kind of interesting. Uh, what I thought was interesting about it was uh, it stars Daisy Ridley and the most minimalist kind of setting you can imagine, which is a drastic contrast to the stuff that she's been known for prior to that. So uh, usually, normally, the case is you, you discover an actress at Sundance or an actor and then and then that actor or filmmaker becomes popular afterwards and goes on to do big budget pair in her case she was kind of plucked out of obscurity put into star wars the biggest franchise of all time she did a she did a pretty great job but it, there wasn't much room for character development or you know incisive like storytelling there it's just sort of it's star wars uh and then she did that kenneth Branagh film so she was, was star-studded film so she's never really had an opportunity to truly display her talents and this film sometimes i think about dying is set in a very small coastal town uh nothing much happens in the film uh she has a boring office job she fantasizes uh, uh about herself being sprawled on the rocks or in the forest dead and that's like sort of like the morbid undercurrent that goes through the film but the film itself isn't morbid at all she meets people like there's a, a co-worker that gets replaced and uh, she meets the man that replaced the coworker, and she sort of sort of hits it off with him. But her her um, lack of communication and her intro, introvert nature sort of goes against his extroverted nature. So that clash is fascinating to observe, and how he brings out the life back into her, how he infuses imbues her with life again. So it's really an interesting kind of character study. And a spectacular showcase for Daisy Ridley. What? Uh, that sounds good. How is Daisy Ridley? Because she's coming off of doing Star Wars, right? Like she's right. she's obviously doing stuff to kind of get people to forget that awful Star Wars sequel trilogy. <laughs> Anything you can do to get her to forget that terrible trilogy. Um, and someone asked the hidden hand asked, does she have any talent? Yes. Yes, the answer is absolutely resounding yes. Like, she holds that film together. I mean, the other actors are great, uh, but she is the, she, everything pivots around her character. And I, I, I think that her, when she read the script, she might have been surprised. Like, she probably has, like, four lines in the entire film. She, it's a very silent performance. So she's very expressive. But, again, she's an introvert. So it's, like, the, my, the most minute gestures exemplify, like, a plethora of feelings. So it's a pretty incredible performance. And... It definitely showcases a side of her that we have not seen before. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks for that, Alex. Let's um let's go to Michael Talbot Haynes. Tell us about this Willie Nelson documentary. What's it called? Oh, it is called um it is called Willie um, Nelson and Family, and it is a five part documentary series um covering the life of uh, Willie Nelson as well as his family who he um usually goes ahead and plays on stage with um I got to see Willie Nelson about 20 years ago at one of his picnics uh where they had Neil Young and Crazy Horse along with Billy Bob Thornton um performing music with lots of other people and every single act um Willie Nelson would get up and start jamming away with um the band that was playing on stage um, with his uh, famous guitar with the hole in it and stuff. Um, you know, like, so basically by the time Willie Nelson actually got on stage at one in the morning, um, we had already seen him about, you know, like eight times already playing with different artists. Um, but that's what <coughs> went ahead and got me the interest of uh, going ahead and one day seeing this man's story. And this is the first official authorized biography um, uh, that Willie has um, allowed to get out. 
And it is everything that you ever wanted it to be and then some. It's absolutely marvelous. Um, if you're not a fan of his music, you're still going to love this because uh, for folks that like the whole independent film thing and the whole impulse for independent film, uh, this series does go ahead and give you justification um, as to why the indie route um, is going to always be the better route. Because um, Willie Nelson worked in the Nashville industry for years as a songwriter, and they tried to break him as a performer, but every single time he would go the Nashville route, it would fall flat on its face. And it was only when he just quit Nashville and started doing stuff his own way with growing the hair long and the whole outlaw bit um, that he actually started um, becoming, you know, like a mega successful artist. And the film just keeps um, hammering that point over and over and over again about he finally, once he started, stopped listening to the industry and started doing it his own way. Uh, that's when the real success came. His son, Micah, makes um, you know, like sort of comparisons uh, to the whole punk rock thing with the outlaw country music and the whole punk rock movement. And then, of course, Willie Nelson is seen wearing a T-shirt from my favorite punk band of all time, X. Um, you know, like in one of the interviews. So yeah, um, lots of fun. I watched all four and a half hours um, in one sitting, which honestly, I think if this does end up on a streamer, that's how the majority of folks are going to be watching it all in just one great big joint. That's great. I, I, I love the idea of like actually something that shows someone who's very successful, Willie Nelson, and going the indie route, anything that kind of like uh, uh, supports that, I love. I love seeing those stories. Like weird, a weird book rec recommendation I'm just going to throw out to everybody. Um, it's a book that was published by The Onion like 20 years ago, maybe, maybe longer. God, longer now that I think about it. It's called The Tenacity of a Cockroach. And the tenacity of a cockroach is a collection of interviews with creative people. And the one thing they kind of all have in common is they've worked for sort of, you know, corp in the corporate space, whether as a filmmaker, a writer, or um, a musician. And then like how they kind of transitioned where they took more control of their creative career. In particular, one of the great interviews in that book is from Amy Mann where she talks about how she transitioned from corporate music. There was a time where under, because of the rules of her contract, she couldn't even publish music and put it out. And she talks about how she made this transition. She's the woman, she did the uh, song Voices Carry, which if you're from the 80s, you'll remember that. Um, I'm the right age for that. And then exactly, and then, and then, you know, she kind of took everything back and she did the music for Magnolia, right? I mean, that was just, those were just songs that Paul Thomas Anderson loved and they put into Magnolia. So I love any story about how a creative person can distance themselves from corporate interference. Do you know where this, uh, where this thing, Willie Nelson and family, like where it's going it, to end up being? You no, know, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if it's already got a um, planned distribution already um, or if they're going ahead and premiering it at um, um, Sundance in order to see um, which um, you know, like uh, streamer or distributor, you know, like it could end up even on television, um, you know, like to go ahead and take it. So, no, I have not. Um, I don't know the skinny as to. Um, when it's going to be available or where, but it is a matter of when. It's certainly not going to be an if because this is the goods. Cool. All right, let's uh, pivot to uh, Sabina. You've got you saw a lot of movies. You were actually on the ground. You were there in Park City, and um, you know I love it. You had the badge. I've got. I keep all my old badges. I love it. I got um, it. <laughs> <laughs> but like, tell us. Tell us, uh, uh, pick a, a movie that you want to talk about, and 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 give us give us the the deep dive on it. Well, I want to go back to Deep Rising because it, it fits our whole conversation about attending or not attending a film festival, and I love this movie because it, I actually saw all documentaries except for one uh, drama, um, but I love this because um, it, it is very it's earth shattering to hear what's going on in our oceans but they also show this beautiful element to why we need to know more about them. 
And there was also the idea of, um, okay, so if we don't mine the ocean, if we're running out of oil and energy and everything's going to be uh, battery and electrified in our future, what the hell are we going to do, right? right? And so right when that question in the movie happens, the scene goes dark and black and there's a complete technical difficulty. Yeah. The was great. That's why attending is kind of fun. The uh -huh. scientist that's in the movie that you're following, he's from Spain, he's very bright, he's very funny, is in the audience and he jumps up and he goes, hydrogen! And everyone's like, yo, okay! <laughs> <laughs> and the film comes back up and they, they it finishes out and the, the this creepy guy who set up this, you know, uh, uh, mining the ocean um, company that went public and he went around to China and everybody to get money and he's claiming he's being this big environmental resource. He's hanging himself and I literally bomb rushed the director after the film and I was like, did he really agree to do this film? And he's like, he signed off. I'm like, does he know? He's like, I guess not. Um, and then Jason Momoa, like I said, no filter whatsoever. Um, very passionate about the project. It couldn't it couldn't have been more interesting. Um, so it was a great experience to go there and see all that go down because it wouldn't happen any other way. Um, so, and then every other documentary I saw, I saw the Brooke Shields one. I saw uh, the Judy Bloom documentary. Well, wait, and, can, can, well, just back up a second uh, on the on the Deep Rising. Jason yeah. Momoa, did he talk anything about the DC? cinematic universe did he talk about lobo or aquaman 2 or amber heard did anyone any nerd at sunday <laughs> ask him about anything superhero related so unfortunately no all right well then there you go that's all i wanted to know <laughs> uh but i okay i really want to hear about what's the name of the the uh judy bloom documentary forever so um, the, and the reason I'm mentioning all these documentaries and I saw the little Richard one is because a lot of directors sat in freaking archives and all grabbed all these interviews from all the same daytime TV shows. And you relived your eighties in every single one of those documentaries, every single one. <laughs> and, and Gene Shalit was in all of them, all of them, Brooke, um, pretty, um, in, uh, Judy Bloom in um, Little Richard and I was like, oh my gosh, like did everyone sit in a room together and just parcel out the 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 news footage? It was pretty funny, but it was very 80s. Like everything I saw, it was all about how the 80s changed everything and that's why we exist in such a bizarre time. Um, every film was too long. I think I can say that for everyone, right? Like it's always just too long. Um, and um, I think that um, some of these films can be made into a series. I think Brooke Shields' documentary should be in a, a, a series. Um, but everyone showed up, too. And um, the Anne Hathaway film, um, it was called Eileen. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. It's a Hitchcock thriller noir film based on a novel um, about, a, it's like a kind of a coming out of Jay story. This woman works in a prison, this young woman, Anne Hathaway, comes in this buxom 40s, 50s chick and went to Harvard, changing the world kind of thing. And this very sinister thing goes down and it's dark, it's gritty and it's cool. And I was like, this is good filmmaking. And it's the same director who did Lady Macbeth. He's definitely an auteur. He's working his way with his style. It was pretty cool. Um, uh, and uh, and then I, I did attend a party or two. I'm not going to say I didn't. And I will say, because the whole freaking place cleared out by yeah. Saturday, it was kind of chill and cool. And I wanted all you guys to be there. I swear to God, like we would have had well, a lot. If it wasn't like $10,000 to rent a condo in Park City, it gets ridiculous. The price gouging is kind of, it used to be Sundance was like a cheap trip. We yeah. all stay together in one condo. There were one one year in the early two thousands. There were like eight of us in a yeah. condo, and yeah. it was it was a blast. Now Sundance has made it just impossible 
for filmmakers, even if you're just like someone like, hey, I'm just a film fan. I just want to attend. I want to get inspired. And it's it's really just become pretty god awful. Chris, I stayed, from- I stayed in Heber City. I, I commuted the whole so time. So you commuted in. Oh, that oh, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's what? because of, I got sponsored in a way, so to speak. Um, well, that's awesome. Davina Duckworth says, Willie Nelson and Family was also a 1971 album title. Alan, I want to see, are, are you starring more uh, comics? I've got Alan? the album. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've got the album, uh, a little Richard documentary, the Spidey Sensei 72. What is the little Richard documentary? Oh, it's all about his life. It, it, it's awesome. Wow. And that woman is going to be a huge freaking director. And it was a CNN production that is no, CNN no longer makes films. Did you know that? That they were taken over by Discovery? And so, yeah, this yeah, was their right, last, yeah. yeah, this was their last film. And it was, it was eye opening. Um, he was a tormented man, but he was he was awesome, and he finally got his just due of <laughs> helping Mick Jagger, David Bowie, the Rolling, uh, the Beatles. He gave them all their style, um, so that was pretty cool. Well, let's go to uh, Ben. Ben, you're up next. Cool. What uh, what film do you want to tell us about? So ever since the Blair Witch Project. I've always liked the Midnight series at Sundance. It's where you see the truly horrific and creepy. And today's offering in my mother's skin is no different. So it's called, it is, in, it's called in my mother's skin. In my mother's skin. Okay, it I, it's is, already a creepy title. Uh, what's it about? <laughs> <laughs> so this is... Filipino filmmaker, Filipino American, probably Kenneth Dagatan's um, first dark fat fairy tale. It's like the inverse of a Guillermo del Toro fairy tale, where you get something that feels horrific but ends up optimistic. In this case, it's horrific and it goes all the way dark. And in the setting of World War II Philippines. While the Japanese are rampaging and ravaging the land, a once prosperous family in a small unnamed village is having a serious problem because the father apparently may or may not have absconded with some Japanese gold. He's gone off to go take care of this problem somehow. And in his absence, both his wife uh, Legea gets sick with something terrible and the family runs out of food. So the oldest daughter named Tala does something that she is told she's absolutely not supposed to do and goes into the deep, thick jungle next to their house. She encounters a fairy played with grand sociopathic charm <laughs> by, uh, what's her name? Let's get this. Um, <laughs> Jasmine Curtis Smith, and the fairy gives her a jar and says, it's up to you to decide what to do with it, but if you use the contents of this jar, it will take care of your mother's sickness. And does it ever. Her mother becomes an Oswan, which is the Filipino version of a vampire, and all hell breaks loose. And the movie takes off after... She tries to heal her mother with the jar and turns her mother into said vampire. So this this was a midnight movie that was played, I'm going to guess, at the Egyptian. Did you see it at the Egyptian? or? Sadly, no. I saw it virtually, but it was yeah, played at the, the We got a Egyptian. screener for it. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're, uh, uh, Sabina was the only one there. All of us are watching okay, gotcha. online. So Ben, <laughs> ben it's, like you're, uh, it's like you're in a video game that's glitching. That's what it... Uh, <laughs> appears to be oh that's my virtual background <laughs> it's what i use for all my meetings there you uh, go. it's a lovely it's a lovely city on the planet of Thra, if you're familiar oh well it's it looks like you're just trying to cover up the unfolded laundry that um <laughs> is clearly in the background um well first of all i love i love indie <laughs> horror films i love indie horror so this is something that i'm sure is probably at some point going to come out but um, I just, I love the title too, In My Mother's Skin. We've got some comments and then we're going to get to Alex. I know you got to go. So let's tee up an inter- a review for you next. But some quick comments here. Um, Brad Young says, so Sundance has become the South Park parody 
of film festivals. It was always like that. Yeah. It's a gay cowboy. <laughs> it's a gay cowboy eating pudding, right? Like that's oh, that. Am I wrong? There's movies that you see at Sunday. No, oh, like, that is that accurate, everybody? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's South Park. Uh, Brad Young just says nope. I think he was referring to the in my mother's skin. Defeat, <laughs> defeat. <laughs> even, am I the only one who hears Little Richard and thinks immediately of a dick joke? You are the second person. I am that second person. Um, Defeater Eater goes on to say, sounds like a Resident Evil plot line. That's a good thing, I think. And oh, yes. Davina Duckworth, flesh-eating fairy sounds the opposite of promising. <laughs> I mean, how graphic is it? Is it pretty graphic? Blood splatter is the main artwork of Act 3. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. And Davina goes on to say, I'm still traumatized by Pan's Labyrinth. So let's, um, oh, wait, we've got a super chat here from Michael Taylor for 10. This show has been amazing. Absolutely love hearing about everyone's favorite movies, feeling the buzz as if I was there. Every film was too long. LMAO. What does LMAO mean? Laughing my ass off. Laughing my ass I just off. want to hear you say it. I know what it means. Uh, Eileen sounds great. Go team film threat. Oh, I love that. And wow. Uh, In My Mother's Skin is going to be available on Amazon Prime. Says Kevin Tino Cavaruche. Yeah, so so that's actually very exciting that Amazon. A lot of these movies, and I'm not disparaging Sundance. I'm just saying a lot of these movies are coming out like right after Sundance. <clears throat> so there you go. Um, let's go to. I know Alex, you've got, you know, you got to leave us early. So let's get you, and we'll get Jason keeps popping. No, we should still put him last. That's <laughs> no, I can't do that. <laughs> Alex is on a time crunch here. <laughs> Alex, tell us, what's the next film that you want to tell us about? If you want my kids to come back and sit here, you know, the one-year-old and the four-year-old, I can stay as long as you guys do want. It, do it. I would love <laughs> Only that. if you breastfeed the one-year-old. I miss my kids being tiny. What's the next film you want to tell us about? Um, the next film I want to talk about was, so my favorite film was Nicole Holofsener's. And to Sabina's point, uh, yes, I agree that every film is too long, but that was the one time where I wish that it could go on and on and on. Like, I mean, we just wanted to keep living with those characters forever. Like, it was 80, 89 minutes or something, and there's something to be said about being succinct and leaving characters and leaving viewers wanting more, as opposed to, like, you know, have it uh, six hours long or something. So the next film I want to talk about was Magazine Dreams, Ooh. which is... Which, uh, which was like, I believe, one of the highlights of the festival. That was the consensus, I think, from what I've read. Uh, I was blown away. Again, I went in with no expectations to Chris's point. I think that when you have really low expectations, you tend to be really amazed by films that are subpar. And when you have very high expectations, vice versa, vice versa like a really good film sometimes might disappoint you just because everybody's raving about it. So, And I'm, I'm the one who kind of tends to go against the, the grain, you know? So if everybody says something's really good, like I never got into Harry Potter. I never got into like all those popular things that everybody loves just because I'm like a cynic and I go against like what everybody loves, but a uh, mainstream taste, so to speak. But holy shit, is that movie like a, like deeply affecting and mesmerizing and like can take your eyes off the screen performance by Jonathan Majors. Like Jonathan Majors, after this film, I'm convinced can do anything. Like he can play anyone from like you know a heartbroken homeless person to the richest man in the world with a plum like he plays a bodybuilder in the film an aspiring bodybuilder uh living in a small house his mom and dad have passed away so he lives in sort of like a in this little bubble in this little kind of depressing bubble where he lives his dreams out every morning he wakes up to just a slew of posters on his walls of all of his idols uh, bodybuilders. He keeps calling one of his idols, trying to reach him. He spends the entire day working on his physique, which is godlike, like Greek god, like physique. This man like sculpted his body to an extreme point that I have no idea how he's, he's even done it. Um, and he and he attempts to win, like, first of all, participate in, and secondly, of course, win uh, uh, some sort of um, uh, contest and uh, gain international recognition for his efforts and the struggle that he is experiencing and 
it, it's 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 very difficult to watch, but you can't take your eyes off the screen because he. I don't want to spoil anything about the film, but it just kind of goes deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. And the second half of the film, he goes absolutely unhinged. So if you want to see Jonathan Majors at his most unhinged, that's the film to watch. You mean you mean it's, don't see Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum Mania, where he plays yeah. Kang the Conqueror. See yes. magazine. I'm hearing magazine dreams. They're saying he is a lock to get nominated for best actor next Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Absolutely. If he doesn't, then there's no justice in this world. I mean, this is this is the performance to watch, like to beat this year, I would say. It's incredible. It's like jaw dropping. Like I walked away from this film and I watched it like four days ago and it still stays with me. It's not a perfect, it's not a perfect film, but he he makes up for all the tiny little flaws that come along the way. Gotcha. Um, that one is at the top of my list because you're not the only person I've heard um, rave about that film and Jonathan Major's performance. I hope that he's really good as Kang because he's effectively the villain of the next phase of Marvel, phase five and six. Not that any of you would know about this. Uh, I think Alan would know since he's a Disney fan and... Um, uh, I'm actually uh, attending the uh, Ant Man premiere. I got invited, so I'm going to go. I think like it's in February. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, we'll see. Are there. you going to the screening or the premiere? Screening. This, well, it's a screening. It's not a premiere. Right, right. I'll be there too with Alan. Alan will be there. We'll all be there together. Okay, and, let's meet up early. We'll go to Yard House before. Excellent. And then okay. and then I looked it up, and he's in two Avengers movies. To your point, coming out. Right. So he's, yeah. he's good. He's 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 got a pretty good career. <laughs> so it's it's a, it's a good bet he doesn't die in Ant Man and the Wasp, but Quantum Mania. Unless unless is... the other films are a prequel yeah. to that film, which you never know. Or, or this one's a variant. And a then, variant. Yeah. The, 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 uh... Well, here here's here's what here's what's interesting is when you do something that's mainstream, the word I'm sure he's very good in the new Ant Man movie. Jonathan Majors is very good. But what what um, I'm curious about is like that will actually help him with magazine dreams, right? Because you do a couple of mainstream things like, oh, that's good. Then you do like a, a groundbreaking performance. It just adds to the fuel of like this guy's a talent deserving of best actor. Jason, I know you've been patient. You've been uh, on and off. Alex, when do you need to leave? Because you've got at least one more movie to talk about, right? I'm waiting for the kids to come back. As soon as they come back, I'll, I'll text you guys and I'll sort of drop off, but they're still gone. So oh, Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, just wanted to make no sure problem. if there's another movie you Thank wanted you. to talk about, we could get in before you uh, before that happens. Always yeah. Also, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I do have a movie to talk about as well, so... Oh, Alan! Oh, you're not allowed. Oh. You're not part yeah, of. I'm, I'm attending this thing too. <laughs> All right, Alan. I'm attending this thing too. <laughs> What's the movie? Oh no! Yeah, I was gonna go after Jason. Yeah. But, um... Well, I was just gonna pipe in, Alex. You couldn't be. It's true. Magazine Dreams definitely had um, a lot of talk, and um, also the shorts blocks. Everyone was talking about shorts blocks the whole time. And and Magazine Dreams. That's kind of it. I mean, but I was really people love the shorts. So I just wanted to throw that out there, like. But well, in there's that a reason behind it. It's it's a, it's an uncom uncompromising feature. And and really quickly to your point, Chris, like as a former distributor, it's absolutely true what you said. We yeah. always feed off of the big releases. So if we have an, right. an actor and he's in a big movie, then we coincide the release of the smaller film a little bit after that one, so that like there's that trickle down effect, and it really works. <laughs> well. Uh... Uh, real quick, J before you go, Alan, Jason saw a film that I also saw at the Slamdance Film Festival, and we have to talk about it. Uh, I am a, I started watching it twice. Uh, Love Dump. Okay, Love Dump is playing the Slamdance Film Festival. It's like a parody of a Hallmark movie. Jason, tell us about Love Dump. Well, there we go. I don't think things <laughs> we can hear you. Um, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's I'll, I'll, already, I'll, uh, you know, in the vein. I, I think I think your internet is pretty bad. Hey, Jason. Can, can you hear me? Hey, um, actually, actually, I got to jump off because I'm near the no end problem. of the time I can participate. But that's all. I only saw Willie at the festival, so that's perfectly fine. All right. Hey, I will see you all later. All right. Take care, Michael. Thanks again Bye, for dropping by. All right, cool. Uh, Jason, I, I think we're really having problems with your that. internet. I think you're hearing us like yes. uh, several seconds after we talk. Is that are you are you on your phone? 
<laughs> yeah. All right, Jason. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to like yeah. drop you, yeah. man. It's no big deal. Uh, you can't uh, tell if he's hearing you or not. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll talk to you later. Everybody, wave goodbye to Jason. Bye, Jason. Bye, Jason. Bye, Jason. We'll see you. Uh, okay. Uh, I, feel bad. I, I, I warned him in the chat. I go if your internet if is your out, internet's we're bad. Gonna, we're gonna I'm sorry, you can't. You can't no, do it. No, don't feel. Don't feel. Bad. Don't feel you bad. Can't. Don't feel bad. Where you're just gonna be dropped off. Alan, <laughs> let's go next for you. Yeah. I'll do love dump. Yeah, no. Uh, what I, what, do you, is, what movie are you going to talk about? I mean, I'm going to talk about the Pod Generation, and, and this is a movie really? that that I can't believe uh, played at Sundance because, you know, I feel like there's a certain politics that you expect from films at Sundance, and this one kind of is, is interesting. Um, it's a uh, first of all, it's this is a movie that that has everything I like about science fiction. It's the idea of taking an aspect of humanity. And exploring it through through a science fiction structure here, and so what's happening is uh, Amelia Clark and Chiwetel Ejiofor star as uh, Rachel and uh, Al Alvi, uh, a married couple. Um, Rachel works for a a tech company developing the new newest uh, AI kind of uh, you know Alexa and stuff like that. Basically, it's Megan. Um, and then uh, Alvi is a botanist who works with plants. I know you know what a botanist is, but this is important. Um, it's a dying art because this is a utopian society where uh, the synthetic is taking over the natural. So all everyone's food is printed on um, is printed on three D printers. Uh, you know, your therapist is now an, an AI uh, program that that you can talk with. Um, and so we're moving in in total tech direction. And um, so Rachel is feeling kind of the pangs of wanting to have a child, but she's moving on in her career. She's moving up in her career. And uh, her company just happens to have a subsidiary uh, called Pegasus, which allows her to have a baby, but in these plastic pods. And so they'll take one of her eggs and whatever, you know, sperm or whatever to, to impregnate it. And then they'll put it in the pod, and then the baby will grow in that pod so that she doesn't have to put her career on pause. And an interesting line in the movie, they talk about now that women can have babies in pods, um, now they have complete sexual freedom over their bodies, which is an interesting point to make in this movie. And so um, so they decide to have this child in a pod. And, um, and what the movie does is just explores this idea of the synthetic versus the natural. And that, uh, and that how a corporation is now able to allow you to have a baby in a pod. Uh, now it comes with these restrictions. It comes with, uh, it comes with a bunch of, uh, you know, caveats to it. You know, they're, they're grown in this sterile environment. Um, and on the other hand, there's Alvi, played by Chiwetel Ejiofor. He is on this crusade to bring the natural back. Um, he, he works at a university and he has students come into his greenhouse to taste real food. And uh, and they have this cabin in the woods that no one goes to because, well, no one has to go into the woods anymore. There are nat there are nature programs or nature rooms you can go into and, and feel, feel nature. And so the whole movie is about this battle between the natural and the synthetic. And, and questions, you know, yes, uh, man and scientists can create uh, synthetic versions of the natural, but is that better? Um, it's almost as if you know you're to take your immune system and say, "Hey, we can make medicines that are equal or comparable to your immune system." Um, but the question is, isn't our immune isn't our natural body, the natural function of things, far superior than what science can make? And and uh, and it really, you know, it really takes some interesting viewpoints. And and again, it's kind of like, how is this playing Sundance? And so, uh, yeah, I I I, I like this because it does exactly what science fiction does it it tells you a story questions something about humanity and causes you to think about it afterwards and consider the ramifications of of decisions and directions we're making and so i i highly recommend uh, the pod generation uh well you're getting a lot of uh comments in the chat alan i think I, we're gonna go to some of the chat comments and questions here uh because just uh, people people are really loving this. I'm really glad that mm -hmm. people are getting to get sort of early takes on Sundance movies. Let me go to these. Uh, uh, the nerd far away says, oh, I wanted to hear about Love Dump. I'll tell you about Love Dump. Jason's review was amazing. <laughs> 
sa says, uh, <laughs> it's okay to laugh. And Defeater Eater says, I love his hat. Fletcher Williams says, Alan, I have something to say. Speak up, Alan. Stand your ground. Yeah. The nerd far away says, now I've got Amy Mann music stuck in my head. Davina Duckworth says, get pumped for magazine dreams. Uh, and then goes on to say, I liked Amelia Clark in Last Christmas. It was a silly movie, yeah. but still touching. And, and she's talking, good in this one. She's good. And talking about the pod generation, uh, Fletcher Williams says, so like, like uh, Orwell? Uh, yeah. and then it says Zedai Skywalker says my social credits and Shuxi yeah. says this sounds scarier than Terrifier 2 <laughs> um, Jamie G says go sci-fi and Defeater Eater says fuck the rest of, dy of the dystopian society give me but give me a microwave that prints food <laughs> would be interesting <laughs> Malcolm Taylor says I'm so excited for magazine dreams so stoked to hear about how amazing it is and the la the lost tale says thought Alan was based for a second oh that'll never happen <laughs> what are you talking about uh, <laughs> energy, corporate motherhood corporate motherhood yeah yeah Fletcher Williams is she living in the pods or eating and eating the bugs the bugs well that's the point is you you can't uh, nature is no longer necessary uh I am the brown says I can never uh, pronounce Chiwetel Ejiofor give it a give it a shot it's not that bad uh and winter soldier says the pod generation sounds like a Paul Kennedy nightmare i can't wait for this one i really yeah. really can't wait for this one um th that when i read that the description of that like i love science fiction and mm -hmm. done by like you know the sort of you know anything at sundance it's, there's going to be more layers to it it sounds like i hate to say this it sounds like we're not that far from that yeah you know, printed food all that stuff it just sounds really really distressing yeah. But see, this is, I mean, we we have this discussion all the time about science fiction. It, it mm -hmm. should say something. Uh, right. It shouldn't just be lasers and starships and, and adventures. It, it should say something about, about the human condition. And that's what I like about this movie. You mean laser swords? Yeah, laser swords. <laughs> laser swords. <laughs> cool. Um, I really want to tell you about Love Dump, but I know some of the other people. Love Dump, which I saw at Slam Dance, and I, I started to watch it twice. I'm probably after this stream, I'm going to go back to finish watching it a second time. But before I tell you about Love Dump, uh, who who wants to go next to tell us about a movie, a single movie? I think it might be Ben's turn. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's let's go. All right. Alex, tell us about what's what's the film? Yeah, don't. Oh, don't uh -oh. do Infinity Pool, by the way. We're going to talk about that this later this week. Oh, okay. okay. That's exactly what I was going to talk about. Okay. okay. All right. We're, yeah. we're going to talk about Infinity Pool on Friday. Infinity Pool recently played. It's um, from a, uh, uh, David Cronenberg's son. What's his Brandon. name? Brandon. Brandon Cronenberg. We, we, we used to about... joke that it was Chip, and then we learned it was Brandon. And we're pretty, it's Brandon we're Cronenberg. Okay, so we're talking about Infinity Pool on Friday because Alan and I will both have seen it. But what else did you see, Alex, you can tell us about? I saw another film called Run, Rabbit, Run. Uh, which was a little bit more meandering than the rest. So it still had a lot of ambition in it. Sarah Snook plays a mother uh, who lives with her daughter. It's just the two of them. And it's um, to summarize it so that I don't wax poetic forever, it's sort of like a, a gradual decline, a psychological decline you're witnessing of the mother as she's attempting to take care of her daughter. And as you do, you know, the onion gets unraveled, layers are revealed, you find out more and more about. Uh, her background and the, the reasoning behind it. So the daughter starts envisioning herself as the mother's deceased sister. She thinks that the, Sarah Snook's character's sister, who has died, is now possessing her body. And so she's talking to her through the body of her daughter, which is kind of a, an intense premise. But uh, the film lacks outright scares, makes up for it in a uh, gradual sort of rising tension and a great performance by Sarah Snook, who's primarily known for Succession, a very famous, very popular show on HBO. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I have mixed feelings about it, but I think that her performance and the, the, the fact that they strive for uh, uh, some sort of psychological depth, they might not nail it, but they, you know, 
how many films, how many horror films they even go for it these days. So I, you know, I gave him extra points for that. Well, I, I, that one, I love anything that's kind of visually interesting. Like this primary image is, is, uh, is bizarre, but I, I just want to remind people too, that like, we're sort of giving you the summary of things. You can always go to filmthreat.com and just read the reviews by this amazing group of writers. Most of them have good internet. Some of the writers do not have great internet. We talk about, of course, Alan and Jason. You guys, I got I got my Spectrum 500 megabytes per second. Very, very, very pleased. The quality of writing isn't directly proportional to the quality of the internet connection. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. But uh, no, I just want to show up, the, uh, show that visual there because it's it's uh, pretty cool. And you can also go read the reviews. Just remind everyone yeah sorry jason i love jason he's gonna be uh he's gonna be joining us at award this in um we're still locking down the date for award this which is film threats award show annual award show and we'll be doing that um we'll, we'll we're getting close to announcing a date it's the only award show you can buy a ticket to all right who wants to go next if it's possible may i interject if it's possible to Please. join the infinity pool uh uh podcast that you guys are going to do. on Friday. It's on have Friday. A, have a lot yeah. of thoughts about it. And a lot of, <laughs> it's a crazy. Okay. Fuck Friday at 9 a.m. Friday yeah. at 9 a.m. We'll okay. send you the link, Alex. Cool. Perfect. You can join. Um, Thank you. Okay, cool. Who wants to go next and what movie are you talking about? Sure. <laughs> what movie? Okay. Um, you just want Sundance or Slam Dance is good too. Uh, just a movie that you really are enthusiastic and want to tell us about. Yeah, you can throw a slam dance in there. I think that's what you're asking. Okay, so my slam dance thing that I saw virtually was a glorious little travel log called Onlookers. Mm -hmm. It's a first film by a lady named Kimi Takasu, and she takes us to a small town and the accompanying village in Laos. And for essentially what looks like to be a week, we experience the day-to-day -day happenings in this place in Laos that we never learned the name of. And it's deeply experiential. It's very cool. And she managed in the editing to set up a sort of break where you know which day you are because every day these four or five ladies show up, sit on the side of the road with these pots. And you're wondering, what are they doing with these pots? And eventually you learn that these are the women tasked with feeding the local monastery of Buddhist monks. And it is so fascinating to watch them every day show up at this place with their pots of food and then uh, at the end, all the monks show up and get it. it it's, 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 it's very cool. I enjoyed seeing the sort of uncanny reactions of the tourists to this part of Laos. It was a central part because you see these river boats with lots of people who don't look uh, Laos in any way show up and um, start snapping pictures of everything. There were other interesting little things going on. Like at one point in the movie, we watch a rowing team go up the river. And then later in the movie, we watch them come back down the river. It's, 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 it's both equally hilarious and absorbing to watch these things happen as a normal slice of life in this gloriously beautiful undisclosed part of Laos. Nice. Uh, cool. All right, wait. Did we did we lose Alan? I'm right here. No. Okay, cool. he's right there. That's cool. <laughs> All right, that uh, that's cool. Let's um let's go to now. You know what? I'm going to tell you about a movie that I saw. I've been watching a bunch of slam dance movies. And I can tell you about a bunch of them, but I'm just going to tell you about one slam dance movie. So let me um, let me do this. Wait, what am I doing? Wait, let's go to some comments here. I actually have uh, some comments starred. Uh, Brett Cohen 
says a company in Cali is trying to raise funds for pod births. So it's not really sci-fi anymore. And Jason Delgado sent a uh, crying there while laughing go. emoji. And there you are. Um, all right, wait. No, here we go. I'm, I'm doing a reset. I've got it all got it all set here. No, we'll just do this. We'll do I want to I want to tell you about a movie called Love Dump. It's basically a parody of a Hallmark movie, your typical Hallmark romance, but it is so self-aware. This movie was made in um it, I mean it's it's dated on on IMDb as 2020. But it's out now because I think a lot of filmmakers very smartly decided that they weren't going to release their movies unless you could do an in-person screening. And I can see why, because this is a movie that you would want to see with an audience. It's a straight up comedy and they don't waste any lines. In addition, I saw it with the closed captioning on and there are jokes even in the closed captioning. Which I I was I've never seen before. I've never seen where you see in the closed captioning and it'll say he walks over to her sumptuously. Like it's like a weird like why would you even put that in the closed captioning? Like they were completely self aware that that a lot of people these days watch movies with closed captioning on, and so they did. I, I, it works so well. So Jessica Dump owns a, a store where she buys and sells garbage. And she lost her father when she was young because he they were building a, a popsicle stick birdhouse that had jokes on it. And the, she only needed one popsicle stick with a joke on it. And she can't find that particular joke pop, pop, popsicle stick. And she meets this guy uh, just sort of randomly. It's the stupidest way. He, he meets her. You know, he's she's on a picnic with some other dude. And this guy sort of smashes into her. And he, ha he ends up with this horrible wound on his leg and she fixes it. Then it cuts and, and they kind of have this moment. He's a dog lawyer. I mean, all of this is played completely deadpan straight, right? Like deadpan straight. I'm a dog lawyer and none of it makes sense. Um, cut to, it says, it's like there's a little cat that says 15 years later. <laughs> and he, he ends up going into this uh, junk shop where he finds her again. They have that connection, gets her phone number, but he loses the phone number. All of the conflicts in this are ridiculous. Everything is over the top. It's played completely straight. And I love it. I don't know. I cannot rave about this movie enough. I think Alan in particular, you're a huge yeah, I need fan. To see you need to see it. It's if you're a fan of like indie comedy, like this is going to be nominated for next year. Uh, Jason actually wrote the review of it on the website. It's so stupid and self-aware and it's just mocking mm -hmm. all the dumb cliches that, that Hallmark movies have. Like it's just, and, and you can tell everyone on, in the movies like having a good time. It's completely stupid. It's how modern romance is portrayed or at least as portrayed in, in, you know, Hallmark movies. And it's hysterical because it's just so over the top. And it's also like, kind of gross sometimes i don't want to get into it but there's like an exchange the relation the relationship between jessica dump and her father is so funny i don't i cannot i can't ruin it i can't ruin it yeah. i just all i just want to say is um uh you know uh you got to check this one out it's totally worth it and it's at slam dance and you can see it if you go to slamdance.com um, if you go, okay, where can you watch okay. that? Yeah, it's actually slamdancechannel.com where you can watch all the slam dance films for $7.99. Uh, there's a two week trial, um, but I would definitely suggest supporting slam dance and, uh, and, and cough up the eight buck. Yeah, eight dollars for one month of access, and you can see, I don't know, there's like 40 or 50 movies. Strongly recommend. You check it out. Wait, see, I had this thing that said the slam dance because this is slam dance, Alan. See? Yeah, slam it. <laughs> slam dance. Slam uh, it. That film. There's, that there's film, a lot of good. There's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, your description of the film actually reminds me of David Wayne's like little scene and totally underrated film. They came together. Have you yes. seen that one with uh, Paul Rudd Ooh. and Amy Poehler, which totally like I've seen it. I've seen it. Riffs it's great. on they like came together. comedy. Yeah, yeah. They came and the, even the title is funny because you know right. they, they came together, you know, I'm saying yeah. like one hundred. So but but the, the whole thing is so hilarious. I can't I don't understand why I made like 
three hundred dollars at the box office. It's one of the best. No, I, I actually I saw that movie in the theater because I I don't know I love Paul Rudd and I I like a, a parody of a romantic comedy. I feel like is the only way you can go at this point. So yes, well you'll like Paul Rudd in Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum Mania. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Alan, say that again. <laughs> say that again, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> oh my God. Alan. What do you want to repeat a joke twice? I mean, that's. <laughs> Yeah, yeah you'll love Paul Rudd in Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum <laughs> Look at you! Look at you! Um, any anything else? I know Alex, you you're on a time crunch. Any other movies that you think we need to feature that we didn't get to feature? Then this is really just a tease because ultimately, if you go to filmthreat.com, you can actually read all of these reviews and you can read them throughout the year. And we'll even like rerun reviews if, like, say for example, Love Dump is coming to theaters or it's out on new on VOD, we sort of repost those on our front page to give them, to give them uh, further, to feature them further. But um, uh, I, I don't know. I think it's probably time for us to wrap it up. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to say like, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to be uh, reviewing all those films from the comfort of my own home. And yes. uh, thank you team film threat. And I hope that, you know, my reviews <laughs> do justice to the films because you know, it is difficult to make a film and it, you know, every film does in a way deserve a standing ovation just for getting made. And then, you know, then come the critics and, you know, rip it to shreds. So uh, props to everybody. <laughs> and thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, take care then. Take care. Perfect. Michael. Wait, Bye. Alan, what are you doing? Alan? <laughs> <laughs> it's like we hated it. <laughs> All right. All right. It's uh. <laughs> We have fun here. We have fun. Um, okay, thank you, Alex. Take care. We'll talk. Bye. All right, let's. Um, all right, let's. Um, but yeah, productions generally don't have. You get to that point, you're going to need an HR. Uh, that's just my personal, and you're going to have to have some. You know, you just have some version of an HR department. So uh, HR departments. Do so, you just feel that, by the way? What's that? Uh, earthquake. Oh, cool. Yeah. That was, it's one thing you don't have to worry about in Utah is earthquakes. Although, didn't they have an earthquake like years there, ago? There are earthquakes around here. There are. They're here. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, too, Please. was that um, Robert Redford did not show up this year. Um, so that was sort of interesting on the street. And uh, um, none of that stuff, nobody attended any of that from anyone that I talked to. Um, but I wanted to mention that I, for the first time ever, I saw one of those um, classic 25th anniversary films. And so they had a uh, slam um, and everyone mentioned the, the film threat review from that way back when they loved it. We've been and around a while. We've been around a while. People do remember. It was pretty cool. You get love from a lot of media outlets. They kind of come and go film threats been around. I don't even yeah. want to say how long it's you been around. It during the screening, you said, or well, I went. I met everybody on a press line, and um, I'll tell you, they all came together. The directors, the producers. Um, Sonia was there. Um, the the big uh, slam guy was there, who's now a huge deal. I'm spacing his name right now. Um, but what's fascinating is the film was about a, a a guy who's who does slams who got put into jail for marijuana, right? And he just got out two years ago and wow. marijuana is legal in DC and it all takes place in DC. And so he was there at this screening and he did do a slam, which was kind of cool. Um, Let's so go. the archives are fun. Well, I will say this film thread has been around longer than Sundance has been around. Yes. Sund well, no longer than Sundance, the brand um, Sundance previous to 1989 was called the United States film festival. I did not know that. Yeah. They changed their name in 1989, which I believe was the same year that Sex Lies and Videotape ah. played the festival and was acquired by Harvey yes, Weinstein. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I know because I've written articles about this, but uh, yeah, no, it changed its name in 1989 to the Sundance Film Festival. And we started going in the early 90s. We started attending Sundance when it became a discovery festival. A few more chat questions and comments, and we're going to wrap it up. Uh, here, uh, Jamie G Voltaic Blood, who's a member, says, and now Chris is going to share about RRR. I didn't say a word about RRR, <laughs> I did not say a word about RRR, but you did mention the whole uh, Luke Conan Leia thing. 
Well, that's true. I did. Yeah. That's another on the bingo card of things that always get talked about. Heinlein says, finally, a comedy. And Shuxi says, Alan gets $50 every time uh, from Disney every time he says that. Is that true? You mean about Paul Rudd and being in... Alan is a man of many talents. Yes. <laughs> I will Clearly. say my boobs have gotten bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, you saw that other video. That's from yeah. that was from before you were working out. Uh, but anyways, let's. Uh, uh, yeah, no, Alan does not. Alan, his views. As much as we tease, his views are completely his, and his alone. And Lord Thoth says, "Bingo." So <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, that's going to wrap it up for us today. I want to thank, I want to thank all the film threat reviewers, not just the ones here on the stream, but all the ones, you know, we talk every day on this chat app called river and I see my film threat family there every day. We're all chatting with each other and I'm really just proud of like how things have continued to grow. Sabina, you mentioned that people were, you know, coming up to you and saying film threat and pulling you out of line and throwing you in the, that's, cool. that's great it's cool it's i love film cool. threat you guys are uh, mean a lot to me you have no idea and you don't know where i am ever but uh, <laughs> <laughs> and i will be at the next awards you bet you're gonna be at award this okay oh, totally. we are we have to lock down a date we had to move some things around but we are locking down a date i'll make an announcement on river and of course publicly so um it's so much fun oh. if you need extra tickets uh, we're gonna say, kind of the same thing we did last year, but there are going to be several improvements of which uh, I, I can't announce right now, but it's going to be really fun. It's the only award show you can buy a ticket to. There'll be drinks, gift bags. Well worth it. You get the whole awards experience. And we don't take ourselves too seriously. We have a great time. I just want to say thank you. Well, I would uh, say one you. improvement is the street in front of the theater has been paved. Oh, yes. look at that. <laughs> oh, Rita, nice. Rita, Rita Ibn Muhammad says, awesome show. I subscribed and liked. Thank you for that. Lord Thaw says, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Thank you. This is the way, says Lord Thoth. Alan Horkin says, great show today. Please do bring the writers back as guests again. We have to do this like a monthly writers roundup at, sure. at the very least, but it's got to be, I think, around an event or something. And Malcolm Taylor says, love dump looks like a riot. Checked out the trailer from Film Threats Review. Looks like the best revenge for anyone like me who's loathes Hallmark style films. Well, if you know the genre, you're going to love it. And yes, I'd love to see more writers. We will do that. We're going to do it. We're going to we're going to do special events around the writers joining us here. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, anyone else have anything to say Ben and Sabina, how can people find you on social media if they want to follow your work? My full name, Sabina Dana Plassi. Cool. And that's on like Twitter, Instagram, all, all over. Right. Yep. Cool. Ben, what about yourself? I'm mostly just on the Facebook these days. You can find me by my full name, Benjamin Alexander Franz, where I talk all things film. Cool. <laughs> and um, you can find me. I'm that Chris Gore and everything. Film, we're Film Thread on everything. Film Thread on Twitter, Instagram, all that. You guys know that. Uh, Alan, what about yourself? Yeah, I uh, my pal Al on Twitter and Film Thread Alan on Instagram. And then on Sunday, I will be doing something with uh, Lorena Creole. So uh, I, I, I'm on her show. I don't know what, what we're talking about. but I, I, When you said something with Lorena, you were doing something with her. I didn't know where you were going with that, Alan. I know, I know you're a married <laughs> I know, I know man. Better. You're a married man, Alan. Yeah. Uh, no, Lorena's great. Lorena Creole, I've been on her show before. She talks about theme parks and pop culture. And she is awesome. Big supporter of Lorena Creole. Just want to also thank you, the audience. Um, we appreciate, we try to bring you different things at Film Threat, right? <laughs> like we, we talk about a lot of stuff, but we try to bring you, you know, coverage of movies from playing at film festivals. We try to bring you that. We try to bring you filmmakers. We have a filmmaker that's coming on Friday. 
what who's joining us on Friday? Uh, director Jeremy Endorfer. He's going to be talking to us about his documentary, One for All, the DJ Chris Via story. Yes. Uh, the movie's out on VOD. Also on Friday, uh, Alan is seeing the new episodes of Velma. We're going to be talking about Infinity Pool, Virtually Heroes, and I am going to see Pathan tonight at the right. AMC Burbank 16. It's an nice. Indian, Indian action movie. I'm seeing it. It's in theaters today, and it is it is playing, but today it's in theaters. I'm getting tickets. I'm going to see Pathan. So there you go. We'll be talking about all of that on awesome. Friday, right? So yeah. cool. Yeah. And uh, just thank you to our audience. We have hundreds of people watching us now. Before, it would be like Alan and I and like 20 <laughs> people. Oh, my God, someone chatted us. What are you, what are you trying to say? <laughs> Uh, but thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy Pathan says Davina Duckworth. I can't wait. I watched the trailer. Have you seen the trailer to this movie? It's in. Yeah. It's yeah. Oh, it looks so good. I, I will. If I can make it work, I'll try to see it as well. And Shuxi says, what, what is Shuxi? <laughs> say? Yeah, you gotta move faster. Chris. <laughs> I gotta move. You gotta move way move. faster when you set 69. These all right good job chris <laughs> look we just you know what we have a lot of fun we have a lot of fun on the show just hanging out and talking movies so i want to thank the audience just for being um you know just like open-minded to like hey a lot of entertainment out there mainstream hollywood stuff is it's iffy it's iffy but you can always find you can always find some good indie films to experience alan what else do you want to say? Uh, let's get out of here. All right. <laughs>